Welcome to the York English Language Toolkit uh, CPD webinar for teachers of English language A-level. This is our sixth annual CPD workshop and the second we've hosted in this online format, um, which of course we're all now complete experts in. Um, and we salute all you teachers, us as well in universities, but all of you who've managed the many rapid changes between online and face-to-face -face learning throughout the year and crows flying past your window when you're trying to teach. Um, today, though, you can sit back and enjoy someone else doing the Zoom work. Um, and although we're disappointed not to see uh, you in person, to meet you, get to, to hear um, direct from you in person, we're excited that, again that so many are able to be involved from all over the UK and indeed uh, beyond. So greetings to those of you who are uh, from Zooming in from other places. You can have your say during the webinar um, by posting questions for the presenters. Um, and... Um, you can do that by using the Q&A button, which you can see there um, on the, the, the bottom of your, your screen, the Q&A with speech bubbles. Um, you can see the programme there. We've got a sequence of uh, two blocks of, of talks um, and then finishing off with uh, uh, a contribution from Dan. If you are on Twitter, you can post your reactions using the hashtag, your, hashtag YorkCPD2021. Um, we have a squirrel as our mascot because um, previous workshops live in York have been interrupted by squirrels, um, but we, we may not have squirrel um, issues, but we may experience technical issues because we've got six different presenters zooming in from their respective homes, and we ask your forbearance in advance for any such issues. We will post edited highlights of the webinar on the toolkit website afterwards, as well as the whole thing. So if you'll lose your connection at any point, don't worry, just log back in, um, sign back in using the link you received from the, the Zoom registration. Um, the webinar has live subtitles, which you can either show or hide as you prefer by clicking on the live transcript button. Um, and you can uh, play with that while I'm talking now, perhaps ready to get the setting you want for the main talks. So the workshop features four case studies um, related to uh, research uh, in the linguistics of the English language based on research from our own department and presented in each case by the authors of the research. And they really are the experts on the topic. So do ask them all the questions you need to. We may not be able to answer all the questions live during the webinar, um, but we'll post answers to all of them on the website afterwards. The pre-workshop materials on the website included a pre-workshop talk and links to a stack of classroom materials, which you can download from the website and adapt for your own use. And when we encourage you to take a good look at those um, if you haven't had time before today. Everyone at the webinar will receive a certificate of attendance. That's why we do the, the Zoom sign-in link. So we've got a, a definite list of who was here. So that's a, a meaningful certificate to prove that you were really here. Um, and there'll also be a, a post-workshop survey so you can give us um, some feedback. Um, but for now, I'll get straight down to business. So I'm going to ask, I'm going to unshare my screen and ask Paul Kurzweil to share his screen as the first talk. And while he's doing that, I'm gonna hand over to Claire Childs, who's gonna take us through that sequence of talks. Thanks, Claire. Thanks, Sam. So Paul Kurzel is a professor of sociolinguistics in our department who researches and teaches sociolinguistics with a focus on youth languages and dialect contact. And I think he's now ready to present his work on the origins of multicultural London English. What is multicultural London English? Um, I have a definition here from Kircher and Fox, uh, who wrote, MLE is used to describe the speech of young people in multi-ethnic areas of London, regardless of the speaker's own ethnic background and their gender. A lot of young Londoners now use MLE instead of the Cockney dialect that's traditionally associated with London. So that's a definition. But what does it actually sound like? So. Um, the best place to find MLE online, I think, is in interviews with people in the music industry. So I have a sample of two guys here. This is Big Zoo. So it's all sins. Then I have to hold that. Do you know what I'm trying to say? But I feel like in my heart, my intention is pure. Yes, I do music to help my family and have fun and enjoy. And not all my songs are just straight positive. Like some songs I'm saying, I'm going to do this to man and I'll do this to man and I'll punch man up and my boy's doing this and da, da, da. But 
It's because I'm reflecting on where I've come from. I'm not glorifying it. Yeah. And then um, this is Morrison. Way back, that was like the one that that, that video that was shot in the Ruthless Record shot was SBTV. It was SBTV, you know. I was one of the first artists on there to do numbers kind of thing, like really. It was a big thing at the time, not because at the time it's the first time people see that I was wet. So it was the first time people heard my music, but they didn't know I was wet. And then Jamal brought that camera out. I'd done that freestyle and then bang, wow, it's a big thing. This, this geezer's wet. This Morrison geezer's wet. Wow. So that's, that's that. Now, um, who speaks MLE and, and when? So the, the way we see it, MLE is on a, on a continuum from a vernacular variety to a youth style. So what say vernacular? Well, it has two meanings. One is that it refers to a local dialect or accent, not a standard, not standard language. The other is more psycholinguistic, shall we say. It's the language that we grew up with, the language that we use when we're paying least attention to our language, most relaxed. So it's somehow semi-hardwired. Um, so the vernacular, or shall we say core speakers of multicultural London English are usually working class, um, minority ethnic speakers use it more strongly, but it's not confined to them by any means. Elements of MLE, especially slang, are available to other speakers, including middle class speakers, as a part of, of a youth style. So, <clears throat> what's MLE like? Well, I can, I'll start by talking about vowels. Um, the, the diphthongs in words like goat, face, price and mouth are, are distinctive. So let me try, first of all, the, the Cockney accent. So pardon my Cockney. Go, face, price, and mouth. Okay, so if I uh, then proceed to, to say this in, in MLE, we get something like goat, face, price, and mouth. Another distinctive vowel is the, the vowel in words like goose, the oo vowel, which is almost like an E, but not quite. So it comes out something like oo, goose, something like that. It's also a feature of the, of the South of England, but it's more pronounced in MLE. What about consonants? Well, one striking thing is that even though Cockney, London's dialect is H dropping, MLE is not. So we talk about H reinstatement. So we have pronunciations like go home, my house, and like Cockney would be something like go home, my house. Um, so that's a distinctive thing. Then there's TH fronting and TH stopping. Okay, now what's, what, what are these? So th is sometimes pronounced th with an F in words like thing. And this, of course, is true of many other British English accents as well, so it's not specific to MLE. Word initial the is often replaced with d. So we have dare, for instance, and this is pretty much MLE only. Word initial th may be replaced actually with t but only in the word thing and in pronouns containing things. So something like you forget the word thing and something. And this is also Emily only. This one is a bit different. So K backing. So K is back to K before what we call non-high back vowels. So, whereas in, in, uh, in other varieties of English, you might hear car, cousin, college, in MLE, you're likely to hear car, cousin, college, with a quite a different k sound. Technically, we call this a uvular plosive. And then we have a new pronoun, man. And I'd like you to just listen to this to get an idea of, of, of how it's used. I don't mind how my girl, I don't really mind how, how my girl looks. If she looks decent, yeah, and there's one bit of a face that just looks mashed, yeah, I don't care. It's so a personality man's looking at. I'm not even looking at the girl pop part like. Okay, so it, so it means uh, it can be used for the first person, but it can be third person as well. It can be a, a generic pronoun. These are the project, uh, projects that I was involved with in the first part of the first decade of this century with Jenny Cheshire, Sue Fox, Avon Dawson, Arfan Khan. And we focused on uh, three London boroughs but today I'm only, mainly going to be talking about Hackney, the inner city um, here, which you can see, which is highly multi-ethnic. I said multi-ethnic, so that what's, the, what's the cause of the multi-ethnicity, if you like? Well, it's to do with migration, and we saw a very big increase in immigration from 1948. So this was 
people from the Caribbean, particularly Jamaica, but also followed by people from South Asia, so India, Pakistan, Bangladesh. And then from the 1980s onwards, we find people from, from West Africa, Nigeria, Ghana, those sort of countries, Somalia, Turkey, South America, North Africa, and many other places. And from 2004, immigration from Eastern Europe, notably Poland, but that's not so relevant for MLE just yet. We don't know what effect the, the young Poles will, will have. The obverse of this immigration is actually outward migration of existing populations in the inner city of, of London to new housing in surrounding counties after the Second World War. Okay, so focusing in then on Hackney, we have a, a borough that in uh, 20 years ago was 44.12% white British, but so in other words, under half were white British, and then there various other ethnicities here, including uh, Black Caribbean and, and, and Black African, plus Indian and a number of others. This gives some idea of, of the kind of uh, ethnic composition uh, that there was at that time and still is today. Okay, did MLE have precursors? Well, yes, it did, obviously. So the, the linguistic repertoire of the first immigrants was, was like this from the 50s to 60s. So the main group was white British, and the second largest group, or still relatively small, was the Af were the African Caribbeans, mainly from Jamaica. And they formed the, the main groups here. The linguistic repertoires of these two groups were based on their ancestral languages. So with London vernacular added for the Caribbean children, we get this. So the white British had London vernacular as their ancestral language, the language they, they continued speaking, uh, plus various forms of standard English learned at school and so on. As for the young uh, African Caribbeans, well, they also spoke London vernacular the, the same way as the white British did. But in addition to that, they had Jamaican Creole, which was their was the language of the home very often for, of the parents who were themselves immigrants from the Caribbean or, or from Jamaica in this case. And then we see another change. We see the rise of something called London Jamaican, something quite distinct. Youth worker and criminologist John Pitts notes the start of a new youth language among young black people in the East End in the early 1970s, when their deteriorating social position was preventing them from living up to their parents' expectations. So Pitts says in his lecture, that the young black Londoners at first spoke with a Cockney accent, like Ian Wright, the black footballer. And then in a few short years, they all sounded like Bob Marley, the Jamaican reggae artist. Now it's clear that this is, this is not the forerunner of MLE because it was not used by white British young people. And interestingly also, it was, it was the form of language that was then acquired by other black adolescents with no Jamaican heritage from other parts of the Caribbean. Mark Seba calls it London Jamaican. Pitts argues that this new Jamaican influence variety reflects a resistance identity. Okay, move on a few more years and Mark Seba and Roger Hewitt note what they call an intermediate black cockney or multi-ethnic multiracial vernacular. Now, this was apparently for use in adolescent peer groups only, but significantly, regardless of ethnic group. It was not a vernacular, in spite of its name, but it was a style that was put on and taken off, so to speak. It had many Cockney features, but some Creole mixed in. I think we can see seeds of Emily in, the, in these comments. In other words, the idea that this is a form of language that's not strongly ethnic in its orientation. What about Emily then? Well, um, there, was no, there were no published studies on London youth language after Severs and Hewitt's uh, 1980s research. So our projects in 2004 to 10 were the first to note the existence of a new vernacular. To some extent, as I said, it was ethnically neutral. It was relatively stable. Its pronunciation features were the most striking aspect, um, as, I, as I've already pointed out. Now, we date the beginnings of MLE to the generation born in the mid 1970s, and we gave it the label Multicultural London English in 2006. The press at that time got hold of this idea of a new dialect, and they decided to call it Jeff Aiken. Um, but this term is less used now with MLE in the ascendancy. 
And then there are a couple of, of references you might want to follow up on, on, on this point at the bottom there. Right, what about the possible origins of MLE features? Well, the vowels of goat and face could be Caribbean, they could be West African, they could be Indian, Englishes, that is referring to English. Um, they could come from Northern England, or they could come from Scotland, although probably the demographics being as they are, not likely that they have a, that are a British origin, but they might well have had a learner variety origin. The people learning English as a second language often end up with those vowels. The vowel of goose, the goose vowel, well, it is very Southern English, actually. Definitely not Caribbean Englishes, definitely not African Englishes, and so on. H, reinst H reinstatement. Well, this is not Jamaican because Jamaican English and Jamaican Creole are both H dropping varieties. And the same is also true of Yoruba speakers of English. They also drop their H's. And they are, of course, the two of the major contributors, if you like, to the multi ethnic population. Could it be the standard forms of English encountered in school? Um, possibly, but you have to note that MLE has mainly non-standard features in terms of its, its grammar, uh, in terms of other pronunciation features like the glottal stop, to say little and letter like other Londoners do. What about TH stopping? This could be the, from the Caribbean, it could be from Africa, could also be learner varieties. As for K backing, well, I don't have any suggestions, well, maybe you do. Um, as for the man pronoun, possibly Jamaica, but the way it's used in London differs a lot from Jamaican Creole. So it's, it's basically homegrown. Now, in this list we've just seen, Caribbean and Jamaican origins are mentioned the most often in this list. Is there a Jamaican advantage? And I want to address this point now. Um, what about the demographic explanation? So um, the early post-World post War II immigrants were the founders. And here we, we, we note uh, Salikoko Mufwene's founder effect. This is the idea that founding populations set the feature baseline for a speech community. So the kind of language features that they had are the ones that then survive through to later generations. But just how many people were actually involved in these migrations? You can see lists here for Croydon and Hackney today. Um, the, the actual uh, proportions of each of these three ethnicities is still quite low. Um, and across the board, though, across London, uh, it's London English speakers who are in a large majority compared to speakers of any single other language. Not across the board, uh, count, counting all the non-English languages together, but uh, taking individual languages. Okay. I mean, uh, the, 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 pop, the, the white British population of, of London is, is below 50%, I think, across, right across. Okay, who were these, uh, who were these um, founders? Well, 802 migrants from the Caribbean colonies who arrived in London on the Empire Windrush in 1948. And here are two quite well-known photos that, that we see quite, quite frequently. So these were the guys and young women as well who arrived back then and laid the foundation. Right, <clears throat> now let's have a look at the actual uh, demo demographic figures here. So this chart shows uh, as a timeline across the bottom. It also then it has three lines, one for West Indians, i.e. Caribbeans, another for Indians, another for Pakistanis. Let's look at the West Indian line, which is the dot superimposed on the straight line. And we can see that the, the, that the numbers rise steeply in about 1953 and continue rising until 1960 and then fall down rapidly. And in the meantime, Indians play catch up, but only after the, after the 60s, really, in the, 70s, in the sort of late 60s, early 70s, the Indians are then in, in the ascendancy in terms of numbers of migrants coming to, coming to Britain. And the Pakistanis follow on behind. Okay, um, so that gives you some picture of the sort of the time-wise precedence of, of the West Indians. So what are, kind of arguments can we adduce now then? Even though the Caribbeans remained a small percentage of the population, could there still be a founder effect? Let's look more closely at, at Hackney. Now, 
In 2011, there were, uh, there, we had a a census which established the numbers and, and the residences also of, of different ethnic groups. So I've chosen the four largest here, uh, the white British, black Caribbean, black African and Indian, which is focus on the black Caribbean group because that's the one we're concerned with today. So this is like a heat map. So the more red or more yellow things are, the greater the number per hectare of people of this particular ethnic, ethnic group. Are, are residing. Um, so you can see that it seems to be, you know, on the, the eastern side of, of, of the borough, um, but there are high numbers throughout the borough, and that's sort of repeated throughout London, really. So the point here is that um, the um, uh, that they were part of the founding population. So there are concentrations of particular groups, and we're talking about migrants now, really. Um, particular groups like the African Caribbeans. And the fact that they are quite numerous in particular areas like those red areas on the previous slide means that the effects, their linguistic effects, can be, it might, might be amplified, at least at the local level. And then lack of segregation facilitated contact and therefore spread of linguistic influence. They were not segregated. Um, they lived cheek by jowl with, with, with the white British population. And an interesting point is, and I think it's important, their language was at least partly intelligible to the existing Anglophone population, unlike the case for the languages from the Indian subcontinent and Africa that were introduced later. And of course, they were mostly literate in English anyway, so they could also speak English. But then the influence of Jamaican popular culture and music was pervasive quite early on, and there's lots of literature on, on this, and it continues today. And this is a striking fact. Jamaican slang in grime and drill music uh, is prevalent, even though many artists are actually of Ghanaian and Nigerian, other African descent. So no Caribbean link, Caribbean heritage with those people. And then the take home slide here. Um, demography, contact and culture are all important. Demographic explanations work to some extent in explaining the persistence of some, of some Jamaican Creole features in MLE. And it could be the vocabulary slang, but it could also be in some, but not all, the vowel sounds. Like you can't tell exactly there's Jamaica and not somewhere else very often. So this linguistic influence is only possible if there's contact between speakers. And this, as I said, existed early on between the Caribbeans and the white British population. And finally, we need to take account of cultural factors especially popular music. Thank you. Thank you, Paul. And um, we now have about five minutes for Q&A. Um, so there's a question here from Richard McDonald, who asks, uh, to what extent should we differentiate MLE from MBE, Multicultural British English, when studying youth language? And why do you think this is important? That's a very good question, and, and you're probably thinking of research in Manchester by Rob Drummond. Um, I think it's, well, okay, distinguished, yes, but um, one, one point worth noting is, is that the, the first research was done in London, so that's why we call it MLE and not MBE. Um, Rob Drummond then um, investigated the same thing in Manchester among similar populations. Um, and he found some of the same features. So there are two possibilities for that. One is that you have, uh, you know, the same linguistic mix in London as in Manchester, plus or minus, and therefore when you sort of stir the, the spoon, you end up with the same, the same mixture of features. The other is that um, some of this is, is cultural. So certainly young Mancunians listen to the same sort of music as, as young Londoners, don't ask me about this, uh, Rob Drummond's your man on this particular point. Um, and so features spread that way through, and also spread through networks as well, but contacts between uh, Manchester and London. But it's certainly true that there are, there's a set of features, and some of them I've already mentioned actually, which are common to Manchester and, and London. And then a second question is from uh, Sue Chong. Uh, what is the possibility that some of the phonetic features of MLE result from natural sound change? 
Yes, that's a good question, uh, Su Chong. Um, one thing, um, the one thing really, really sort of come, stands out is this p sound, because it only occurs uh, after, um, before I should say, back vowels, R type vowels, and not E type vowels. So people don't say, they say kit, not pit, which is quite difficult to say. So that's something natural about that. But um, yeah, and also the use of the use of t for th is quite natural, I think, uh, th being unusual. But I think it's more likely to be borrowing from other language varieties for, for the most part. So um, it's not, one or two things are natural, but many things are not, I'd say. Then Alison Wilcox should just ask, can you give an example of key backing? So I guess you kind of answered that a little okay. bit. Do you want uh, to expand I'll, a little bit on that? I'll try and say it again. Okay. <laughs> the word college. I'll say it with my own curse sound, college. And I'll say it with the Emily version, college. Not very good. College. College. Okay. Um, how does that sound? That's good to me. <laughs> Perfect. Um, there's another question. Um, are there any varieties similar to Emily in other places in the UK or other countries. So I guess this relates to Rob Drummond's work as well, but are you are there any other cities apart from Manchester that you're aware of that have something similar? Yeah, the only city I'm aware of is, is Birmingham, actually. Um, I'm not familiar that I haven't heard any reports from anybody from Leeds, which is not far from Manchester, but a little bit smaller not Edinburgh, Glasgow, other big cities, or Liverpool. Um, I mean, there are, it, I think it depends a lot on the kind of ethnic mix there is. London is fairly unique in having such a very high degree of ethnic mixing and a relatively low level of residential segregation. Okay, so that residential segregation, which is not, I mean, it's not policy or anything, it just happens, right? So in some cities and towns around, around England where there was a migration of one particular place, they tended naturally to settle together. Uh, I think you places like Bradford, for, for example. Um, so you get more to the extent that, that the uh, British Asians who live there speak differently from other British people. Um, it's, it's, it's an Asian influence rather than a sort of mixed in with other, other ethnic groups. Um, and I, I think that's about it. I mean, Bristol possibly, but it seems to be that, it seems to be those cities. And then overseas, we're talking about uh, North European capital cities, so Scandinavia, Germany, Netherlands, Belgium, possibly Paris as well. That's great, thank you, Paul. Uh, and I'll now ask Paul Drew to take the floor. Um, so Paul is our next speaker. Paul Drew is a professor in our department focused mainly on research. Uh, he teaches modules in multimodality and language as action. Uh, Paul will be using some slides and also a data transcript handout. Um, and if you do want to follow along with the handout or look at it later, it'll be available on our toolkit website uh, on the telephone therapy case study page. Um, so whenever you're ready, Paul, the floor is yours. Hello and, and uh, thank you very much for, for this invitation. I'm, I'm really very pleased to, uh, uh, to, have, been, to have been given this opportunity uh, to talk to you about uh, research that we've been doing in the department into the NHS's uh, psychological um, telephone therapy program. I'll say more about that in a moment. I'm going to focus really on aspects of language use in therapy sessions. Um, which I think these aspects of language uh, could be uh, feed directly into work that you may be doing with, uh, with your students uh, if you're looking at language of, of the workplace setting. Um, and um, uh, the workplace that we're looking at particularly um, is the NHS. Um, so it's a medical workplace. Now, you wouldn't necessarily think, well, the NHS medicine is a workplace, but I just wanted to point out, this is my third bullet point here, uh, that the NHS is a workplace. In fact, it's the biggest employer in Europe, and it's the world, world's largest employer of highly skilled professionals. 
um, 1.3 million in, in England alone. So that one in every 25 uh, working age adults works in the in the NHS. So um, so this is very very definitely a workplace setting. Um, and I'm going to be looking uh, now at a, a very specialised uh, form of medical setting that is the NHS's delivery of what's called IAPT program, improving access to psychological therapies. Uh, this program, um, which was devised and introduced. Um, uh, 13 years ago. Um, this work is based on NIHR funded research. NIHR is the National Institute for Health Research, which is the, the research arm of the NHS. In other words, this research is being done in a sense within the NHS. Um, and uh, we've uh, produced a number of publications, research publications, which are listed at the end and, and which you have access to. Um, I've given uh, with Annie Irvine. I did this work with, with Annie Irvine and she and I have, have uh, recorded a 10 minute talk, which gives you kind of background to, to both IAPT and to our project in more detail than, than uh, I'm going to do today. So do, uh, do if you have time, look at that. But in case you haven't had time to look at this before uh, this afternoon, I just give you a, a, very, um, a, a very rapid overview. As I say, it was introduced 13 years ago uh, to develop, uh, deliver psychological interventions within primary care. What that means is that uh, people's GPs um, uh, refer them to, uh, to the IAPT program. And it's now the largest national program. This, I'd say, as far as we know across, across the world, this is the largest national program of mental health intervention, mental health care. And it reaches hundreds of thousands of patients a year. Um, broadly speaking, IAPT deals with uh, common mental health problems of stress, anxiety, and depression. Uh, and I should say that, that the, the figures are, are rather out of date, that 1.1 million in 2018-19. In of course, under COVID, that number will have soared because what used to be given as in person, you could do uh, 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 either in person meetings with, uh, with a therapist or uh, by telephone. And of course, all those uh, in person meetings have been, uh, have been stopped. Um, so this is a, a talking therapy that will turn out to be important. One of my la last slides will be about the role of language and talk, conversation uh, in medicine. There's a talking therapy and it's delivered uh, um, th through uh, by telephone. The telephone interactions between patients and what are called personal well-being practitioners, PWPs. I'm going to try and, and uh, refer to those as practitioners, but I may from time to time fall back into my NHS kind of habits of, of saying PWP, forgive me if I do that, but I'm talking about the practitioners, the, the trained professionals who are uh, delivering the, um, uh, the program. Um, the program itself, in, in terms of what actually happens, um, is very uh, highly structured and standardized. This is to reach as wide a range of, of people as possible. Uh, it's, a, it's a mass um, program really. And uh, in order to, for resources to be used efficiently, um, these are relatively highly structured uh, through standardized, through using standardized protocols. And you'll come to see what I mean by that in, in, a, in, a, in a moment. Um, on one side is the standardized protocol, the structured approach. On the other hand, uh, the aim is to be flexible enough to deliver a tailored and personalized experience for patients. You know, patients have uh, personal problems to talk about and want help with. And so the, the, uh, the system has to be flexible enough to both be standardized, but at the same time personalized. And that will be, in a sense, the key theme of what I'm, uh, what I'm showing, what I'm talking about and showing. That is the language of the PWPs and the patients, sorry, practitioners, I fall into it already. Language of practitioners and patients in a way reflect, uh, uh, both uh, reflect the way in which practitioners are attempting to balance standardization with personalization. Um, that balance is tricky it's difficult to bring off. Uh, and one might say there's a tension between, of, of course, as you would expect, between standardization and personalization. Uh, a, a 
a, a balance and attention that NHS practitioners, including, of course, the, uh, the, the uh, PWPs, those practitioners, are very well aware of. Uh, they and their managers and the whole design of the system is very concerned about getting that balance right somehow. Uh, so our, our work is, is um, playing a role in, uh, in, trying to, in trying to get that balance right. And our work is, is now being cited in, uh, in the NHS and used in uh, training. Um, we, uh, our, our work, the work that Annie and I uh, did uh, was based on recordings and analysis of real life at, at, at telephone sessions. Uh, we collected something like 200 uh, sessions. And our method is conversation analysis, which I'm not going to say anything more about uh, at this point in, in, um, in detail. Um, that, that's for after if you are interested. Um, I'm going to show some data and I just want to give you a caution about these data. The caution, firstly, in terms of, of you're absolutely entitled to use this, uh, with with these data with uh, with them um, with your students we have permission to use the, to use them for publications and all the data are in the already in the public domain um, but nonetheless and this is the 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 real part of the, the caution uh, to to please be aware that the the problems that that are discussed include things like bereavement the loss of a child eating disorders and many others and and uh, and other, other, I mean, many patients will, will have experienced some, um, more than one of these. Um, so, and they are, they are distressing matters. And if you, if you think you might be affected by any of these, do feel free to tune out of this section and return for the next talk. Um, I'm going to, to, to work in this way. I want to show four short excerpts from IAPT telephone consultations. As I say, the principal theme is this one of how the talk is shaped by uh, the structure and protocol and how each, both, both practitioners and patients cope with that. Um, patients, of course, are there seeking opportunities to tell their story. They have problems that they want to talk about. And so they, their, their role in this, of course, is to tell their story. Be very clear that I'm, and, and our work does not uh, make judgments about the effectiveness either of individual PWPs or the, uh, the effectiveness of the service as a whole. We're only pointing to linguistic features of how each the, the practitioners and patients manage their, their roles and their, their work in, in, these, uh, uh, in these interactions. Um, you'll see that I've uh, highlighted the practitioner's talk in blue and patient's talk in yellow. And uh, transcription symbols um, will uh, be av are available on the event website. Now I'm going to do something which I hope will work, which is now to move to um, a different, uh, I'm going to abandon slides for the time being uh, and show you um, data. These are the data excerpts. Um, the points that I'm going to make are available. There is the, the slides actually continue. It's just that I can't deal with the, both the slides and the data on the same, on the same screen at the same time. Uh, but you, we will find uh, summaries in some cases a little bit more than what I'm uh, able to say now uh, on, those, uh, on those slides. So do take this in conjunction with the slides that you have available to you. Um, the these sessions begin with patients being taken through what's called the Patient Health Questionnaire, nine, PHQ-9, and a Generalized Anxiety Disorder, GAD-7 questionnaire. In other words, um, patients are given a questionnaire and they're asked uh, to, to provide information in response to that, which will then be the basis for their assessing uh, their state of health, their state of mental health. I've got a simple point to make on this first excerpt. Um, that is that um, uh, this, the language here, and I'm focusing entirely for the moment on the practitioner's language, the PWP's language. The language of the PWP uh, is, uh, as it were, scientific. It's the language of science and measurement. 
So right away in line one. So first of all, this is the very first thing that, that, a, that a patient has asked. PHQ-9, uh, that's the depression screening tool. So who, depression screening tool is very much a kind of measurement, measurement system, scientific measurement. And then the, uh, the practitioner continues in line six. Today, he scored 20 out of 27. That tells me that's in the severe category for depression. Um, scored 27 out of, uh, sorry, 20 out of 27. Uh, the score is of course, again, a measurement. So the, the patient is being measured. And that tells me is uh, that the measure indicates, um, it's, this is not about uh, a kind of, a view that we might have, a, a more qualitative view, it's that that measure tells me you're in the severe category. And that's repeated in line 10, that tells me. Um, uh, that tells me that your anxiety is okay, it's below the threshold. Now to be below the threshold, again, is the language of, of um, uh, the language of measurement. So the, the practitioner's language at this, at this outset is very much one of in which the patient has been, as it were, tutored into uh, a, a scientific measuring kind of a, a approach to assessing their problems. Um, you might think, if you're working on this with students, and by all means do, you might think about how else, and that's exactly what we're doing, actually, uh, how else uh, the... the uh, um, the practitioner uh, might have explored the patient's problems. This is ex exploring the, the severity of the patient's pr problems, and th there might be other ways of, of exploring those um, that you, you, you might uh, think would, would work. Um, uh, the patient's role in this is, is really just to confirm, uh, uh, as in here in line 15, uh, the, um, Peter, uh, the practitioner asks, is that right, and the patient uh, agrees yes and then okie dokie is a is a rather um, uh, let's say informal end to that so you've got a formal scientific measuring system set a section and then uh, and then um, uh, this uh, informal move on now a second case and here i'm going to talk both about the um, both about the practitioner's language but also the patient's First of all, the practitioner in lines one and two asks this question. So little interest or pleasure in doing things. How often were you experiencing that? Now, linguistically, that is a rather unusual construction. You wouldn't, in ordinary talk, and one's thinking about what are the differences between workplace language and the language of, of ordinary informal conversation, let's say. Well, in ordinary, uh, you know, if, if a friend was asking you about, you know, how often do you do you feel you, you don't have pleasure in doing things? You might ask it in that way. But here, the syntax of the question is reversed. So little interest or pleasure in doing things, and then you get the question, how often are we experiencing that? That is what linguistically is known as a left cleft, uh, or a, 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 um, a, a, it uh, moves the topic um, to a... Um, uh, a hanging uh, topic left dislocation. That's, you don't need the language and it's there in the uh, PowerPoint. Um, but it's a dislocation in the sense that it's a left dislocation because what would have come after is being dislocated to come before. What that tells you is that the PWP is reading from the protocol. Um, that's to say the, the, what she has in the protocol is so little interest or pleasure in doing things and then uh, the, the uh, practitioner adds the how often we're experiencing that, which are from the instructions given before. Um, now, just to focus a little bit on the patient. The patient now has a, a question, but they have a, a personal problem. Well, they answer the question, first of all, in, in line three, in quite often. That's an answer to the how often, quite often. But then the patient continues. And in continuing, the patient elaborates, because I'm one of those people that, and from there on, they give quite a, a, a vivid and a, a elaborated account of, uh, of their problem. So when you, I've highlighted this, because I'm one of those people that, is, is this patient's continuation into, uh, into their story about their, their problem. There is something very interesting about, because I'm one of those people that, which is that 
uh, the patient categorizes themselves. That's to say, one of these people is a category of person. Very briefly, what that does is to make, by treating this as not just about me, but uh, a, 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 I am one of a number of people, a, a category, a type, then it makes the, uh, the difficulty that they face more explicable, more understandable, more recognizable. One other thing here is, and you by all means do read these through more carefully uh, afterwards. Uh, uh, the, the patient says, I can't go out. This is an, uh, an account for not being, not being able to go out and see people. I can't go out is of course a constraint, an inability to do something. And that is what accounts are. We give accounts that are constraints. So it's not that I don't go out or I don't like to go out or anything of that kind, it's that I can't go out. And then finally, from the patient's point of view, here we have a paradox. I don't think they want me, uh, but, but they do. That's a paradox. Paradox is widely used. Uh, and I've um, uh, written about it in relation to suicide notes as well. It's very widely used when, um, when uh, someone has difficulty explaining, difficulty putting things into words, exactly what's, uh, what's uh, happening. Um, so. Um, they're, they're they use a paradox as a way of exp trying to explain their, their problem. I'm going to move on to uh, um, the third example. Um, and here again, I'm just gonna go through a, a couple of other questions with you, if that's all right. Yeah, that's fine. Uh, lovely. And then the, the practitioner asks in line five and six, do you have any children under the age of 18 at all? Now notice the patient says, no, unfortunately not. Now, the unfortunately um, is, uh, has implications. It, it's what uh, uh, we would think of in, um, um, in linguistics as having Im implicature. Um, there's a story there. We don't know what the story is, but it's not the patient doesn't say no, or no, I don't, or something simple like that. The unfortunately says there is something to be, to be revealed by this. Maybe they've tried to have children and can't, but whatever it is. You'll see that it's in line 28 where the patient uh, makes that explicit. Uh, we also lost a, a child. Um, so, it, it, but, it, but it's uh, first of all mentioned indirectly there in line eight through the implicature. So the indirectness of that. Notice that the, the PWP in response, uh, that response, okay, that's fine. Uh, refers to this as having the, the, the no as having been an answer to the question. Uh, no, I don't have children under the age of 18. Uh, it doesn't pick up on, unfortunately. Again, be clear, I'm not criticizing the uh, PWP for this. Uh, that is the nature of a protocol which they are required, uh, their performance review you know, requires them to, uh, uh, to do it in this way. Uh, but the, from the patient's point of view, They've indicated something implicitly uh, that hasn't been picked up, and therefore it's only in the uh, the elaboration of their story from line twenty eight on uh, that um, they're able to uh, uh, to then be more explicit about why why they don't, and that indeed was the core of their trouble. Um, and uh, just a point on the on the PWP's language uh, is that these are fairly minimal assess uh, um, minimal acknowledgments. The yeah uh, yeah okay, and so forth, uh, okay, and uh, okay, that's fine. Uh, okay, that's fine, then moves on to a, to a next topic. That's a kind of closure. Um, now, moving on to the last, the fourth excerpt. Um, again here, have you been assessed by a psychologist or a psychiatrist in the past? The patient again answers that question. They, in each case, they answer the question, I've seen a psychologist. But then the patient takes the opportunity to add, to elaborate, to then begin to reveal their, their story. That their story is about their problem. I've seen a psychologist uh, uh, after, um, after my uh, partner passed away. Okay, and what was the outcome? And again, we get the okay, the acknowledgement, and then what was the outcome really goes back to the, uh, the answer I've seen my psychologist, uh, after I've, I've seen a psychologist. Um, so you get, now this, in, this is very different from ordinary language, ordinary, ordinary conversation. 
in ordinary conversation, what you do is you respond to the last item first and then go back to previous items before. So the first response would be to the partner passing away in ordinary talk, but not here because this is uh, uh, driven by the protocol. Um, this is then elaborated uh, quite extensively here. And you see it once again, the, um, uh, the, the uh, practitioner's responses are relatively minimal acknowledgements. The final point I want to make is, uh, is this in uh, line 35. Line 35 does that same, okay, that's fine. We find these absolutely recurrently. That's the way of clo closing that uh, section, that, that part of the, uh, of, the, um, of the questionnaire. And uh, then the PWP goes on to say, we'll come back to those in a minute. There was another case example two had exactly the same formulation. We'll come back to the, these in a minute indicates that what the PWP is doing is to orient to the agenda. These, these are standardized sessions. They have standardized uh, sections in the agenda and this isn't the moment for talking about your problems. So we'll come back to that in a minute. Um, and you know, are you taking any medication with currently? That's moving on to the next question. Um, now, those are the uh, uh, the observations that I have on. Um, um, uh, sorry, I've got, got myself tied up here. Uh, on the uh, data, there are others, and you'll find other points in the in the in the PowerPoint. Um, I want to just summarize. Uh, and you'll find the summary again on the PowerPoint, but to save the kind of the technical glitch that could occur if I uh, if I try and move from the uh, um, from the uh, PowerPoint, from the uh, handout to the PowerPoint, just to summarise, what I've done is to highlight, identify, and highlight features of the language used by both PWPs and by patients in the work tasks of each. Each has a work task, but the practitioner has the task of delivering this protocol and of getting information from the patient, which will uh, uh, help to assess uh, the severity of their, of their um, difficulties. Um, at the same time, the patient, of course, has a task, which is to, um, to tell the story. They, ha they have uh, uh, um, problems to, to talk about, and that is their task, their work task. And so I've identified uh, features that, um, that relate to each. And of course, PWPs are constructing their language to administer the standardized protocol. And uh, in response, uh, patients are finding ways to, as it were, circumvent or, or break, through the, um, break through the constraints of a protocol. Uh, so there, there's that tension. And again, uh, this is not a criticism. It's, it's, this is the way that, uh, that these are. And the uh, PWPs do their very best to um, to administer it in a, in a let's say, in, in a humane and personalized way. Uh, a, a final, a final uh, point, um, that is that key, language is the key. Notice that I haven't said anything about, uh, got you, uh, I haven't said anything about psychology in this. You might have expected this to be about psychology. It's about language. And I just wanted to, this for you and your students. There is, I think, a current narrative about the humanities including teaching of English and so forth, uh, which is, I think, let's say it's devaluing uh, what we do, uh, but the current narrative appears not to recognize the practical application and utility uh, of, uh, of our understanding about the role of language and communication. I've done a lot of work in, in me medicine and in neonatal intensive care on uh, medical records in the US and so forth. And all this work is about, about language in this way and it is practical practically useful, that is, it makes a difference. And I think we, I think students should be aware of that. Over to you. Thank you, Paul, for a great talk. Um, we're in a little over time, so we'll just have time for one quick question. Um, so Dan Clayton, who's on, who you know, is on, uh, just wrote on Twitter, um, Heather's feeding the information to me, um, the interactions between practitioners and patients are great for looking at different spoken genres and their syntax. Um, and a good example of how we don't usually speak in sentences. I just wondered if you had any thoughts on that, Paul, um, you know, about the sort of 
these one word responses sometimes can give away quite a lot of information and it's very different to the spoken. Spoken and written genres are very different, aren't they? Well, they are, but actually um, what we're finding in spoken interaction is also applicable to, um, uh, to text. I, I just mentioned work that I'm doing with, with uh, John Hopkins on medical records, and it's particularly on the racial and uh, gender bias, the absolutely unconscious bias in those records, um, which uh, arises from the use of um, uh, evidentials. You know, the, the patient claims that, or her record says that, et cetera. These are evidentials, and these introduce a tremendous amount of bias into, uh, into text. So uh, a, a, lo a lot of, and what I said about paradox may be used in, in verbal interaction, but it's absolutely there in, uh, um, in, um, in te uh, text as well. But, uh, but the point was about sentences. Is this about sentences used by the practitioner or by the patient? Uh, I think either, yeah. just generally. Well, yes. I mean, the, and a very good example was, uh, no, unfortunately not. That patient's re reply, which is a very, you know, three words. Um, and the, uh, uh, the, uh, the unfortunately is put in there uh, to indirectly indicate, there is my problem. Um, and, and, the, the, and of course that would work in, in ordinary conversation, that would work but it doesn't work in this setting. The patient then it has to be more explicit. Um, equally, there are some things that the, the, uh, the, the practitioner says in a, in a single utterance, single sentence, which are also uh, very, very important. They, they indicate to, uh, uh, to the patient something like, okay, that's finished with that question. <laughs> that's enough information on that question. We've got to move to, an, to another one much as you would have done if you had had a word in edgeways. <laughs> Thanks, Paul. Um, so um, I'll pass back to Sam now, um, but if any more questions, uh, there are any more questions among the audience, please feel free to ask at any point. Um, and I'll, yeah, I'll pass over to Sam for the next part. So I'm going to do a one minute ad break. So I'm afraid there isn't going to be time to put the kettle on. Um, but if you, I wanted to just point out um, so that we have just a, a minute of headspace between talks. At the bottom of the uh, workshop webpage, um, these sections here, uh, which have got some sort of general supporting information that's going to be useful for you. I'm going to talk about these two points here. Um, so on the left, it talks about the fact that our classroom materials are open access. So you can download these, reuse them, adapt them as you need. You probably might have done that anyway, but just to reassure you, you can do that completely um, uh, legally because we are publishing them under this kind of uh, Creative Commons license. And also to advertise that we've got an index. I'm afraid it is biased towards one of the exam boards only, AQA. And sorry about that bias, but it sort of reflects the bias out there in um, take up of different boards. Um, but this index, if you want to look for something to go with a particular part of the spec, um, there's an index there pointing you to how you could use our different case studies for that. So I'm going to stop there again. I'm going to stop sharing and I'm going to ask Catherine, who's our next speaker, to share her screen ready for her talk. And while she's doing that, I'll hand back to Claire again. So uh, settle in for the next section of talks. So Catherine, our next speaker, is currently a lecturer in linguistics at Cardiff, and uh, but we're delighted to say she's going to be joining us at York as she's recently been appointed lecturer in language development. Um, and Catherine researches and teaches phonological development and language acquisition, and she'll be talking to us about iconicity in child language acquisition. Thank you, Claire and Sam. Um, so today, I, indeed, I'm going to be talking about iconicity and the role that this plays in children's early word learning. Let's start by considering what is iconicity. Um, and I like to demonstrate this by replicating a famous experiment that was introduced by Gerhard Köhler in the 1970s. So you can see there are two shapes on your screen right now, hopefully, um, a green shape and a purple shape. And um, a poll should pop up at some point that will ask you to decide which of these shapes is a booba and which of these shapes is a kiki. So if you could uh, quickly answer um, what you think about these two shapes, that would be fantastic. Um, I will also respond. Just 
give you a few more seconds to um, uh, to to decide um, if it wasn't super quick. Okay, so I'm going to say that's time up now. Um, if you agreed, oops, sorry. If you thought that the green shape was a um, a kiki and the purple shape was a booba, then you would be in agreement with 98% of respondents who have participated in this experiment across cultures, across ages. And I can see in the results that 95% of you thought that the purple shape was the booba and the green shape was the kiki. So um, this is a really great example of iconicity because somehow across all the participants in this workshop, um, we were pretty much in agreement that the green shape was a kiki. There's something spiky sounding perhaps about the word kiki, and there's something round sounding about the word booba. And this is called sound symbolism. It's the idea that we associate certain kinds of physical properties uh, with certain sounds. Um, and across languages, this is pretty consistent. But we can see this in words in English as well, um, in words such as tiny and huge. We, may, we might say that the word tiny kind of sounds small and the word huge sounds quite big. So how does this relate to language acquisition? Well, um, Piaget um, suggested that uh, the words and their meanings are what we call arbitrary. That is that if we take um, a, a, a concept or an object such as uh, my cat, Edward here, who's actually just made an appearance, so he may be joining the, uh, the workshop any minute now. Um, my, so if we take this cat here and the word cat, we can say that these, these two things are not related. There's nothing particularly cat-like about the, the object cat, right? So if we replace the word cat with the word dog, um, we wouldn't necessarily feel like the word dog was any less cat-like than the word cat. Um, it's kind of, um, so basically these two things are, are not connected. They are arbitrary from one another, which is a bit, better, a bit easier to illustrate when we think about words that are not arbitrary. So this is, in some cases, words and their meanings are not um, separate from one another, or not as much so as Piaget proposed. Um, and a great example of this is onomatopoeia. Um, onomatopoeia represents sounds from the environment. So the word meow represents the sound that a cat makes. So there'd be a real incongruence if we replace the word meow with the word woof woof, because woof woof doesn't re represent the concept of a cat's meowing. So onomatopoeia are not arbitrary, they are iconic. And the word that we've just seen in the previous slide, kiki and booba, also, while they're not real words, they're iconic because they represent the thing that they, they sorry, they sound like the thing that they represent. Um, and indeed, there are lots of different kinds of iconic words. So words such as tiny and huge, glisten, shiver, and the word to represent distaste or disgust, all somehow represent the thing that they are referring to. So onomatopoeia are just one kind of iconic word, and I'm going to be talking about them specifically in my talk today. Because I'm interested in onomatopoeia, because when we look at children's early words, even across languages, we find that iconic words, but specifically onomatopoeia, are present in the earliest words that children learn how to produce. So the data you can see here is taken from a big data repository of children's early words called WordBank. And I've selected five languages, including British and American English. And these are the first 10 words in those languages that uh, children tend to acquire. And if we look at uh, the uh, iconic or onomatopoeic words in this data set, we can see that across languages, children are producing onomatopoeia in their very earliest words. So children acquire bar very early on in British English, woof woof and yum yum in American English. And in Swedish, children in, in this data um, acquire 50% of their first 10 words are onomatopoeia. And there's lots of evidence to show that um, on onomatopoeia are indeed very common in children's first words. So just um, in uh, three examples here, um, a study of 12 different languages showed that about 20% of children's first words are onomatopoeic. A study of French showed over a third of infants' early words are onomatopoeic. And then a big study looking at hundreds of children um, across different languages found that about 30% of English words and 41% of Cantonese words are onomatopoeia. So there's, there's clear evidence to show that this is a, a quite possibly quite an important kind of word in the early vocabulary. 
And researchers have proposed that onomatopoeia and other iconic words might be easier for children to learn because they help children figure out word meaning links. So when a child's vocabulary is still quite small, it could be very useful to have iconic cues in language that help children connect words with their meanings. And, um, um, is linked to my talk today, I discussed the, this in some depth. And what I want to propose is that while iconicity can help children learn words, I think actually there are lots of other features of onomatopoeia other than just the fact that they're not arbitrary that might help children learn them. Um, it's not just that they're easier to map form onto meaning as has been proposed by other researchers, but there's some other things as well that we know about early development that are really important in onomatopoeia. Um, so, I'm going to talk about two of those things today, but I propose that there are three reasons why onomatopoeia are important, um, or apart from the, um, the fact that they are connected to the meaning of the word. And that is, first of all, they're very um, relevant to caregiver speech. Um, they're also very important for the way that infants produce words, and they're really useful in interactions. I'm not going to talk about the first one today because I talked about caregiver speech a couple of years ago at, at, the, at the workshop. So you can check out the slides um, from that if you haven't already uh, seen that talk. So <clears throat> let's start by thinking about um, infants' early words and why onomatopoeia might be useful in infant speech. Well, we know that infants' early words are phonologically simple, so they're very easy to articulate, such as dada, mama, ball. And that also, they also tend to include uh, reduplication. That is the repetition of syllables, as in dada, mama, and in, of consonants as well. So baby, bottle, um, yeah, baby, sorry, would be a reduplicated consonant. Um, and then when we think about onomatopoeia, we see that these are also pretty uh, phonologically simple. So ba, moo, quack, quack, often reduplicated, quack, quack, woof, woof. They're also uh, phonetically and phonologically flexible, and I'll talk about that in a second. And I'll also talk about why the prosody can be really meaningful, meaningful in these words. So that is the sound effects that children can use in producing onomatopoeia. So with this in mind, then, it seems that onomatopoeia are perfectly set up for early acquisition. So I, I decided to look into this in, in a bit more depth by looking at some data from um, children interacting with their caregivers. So I looked at 16 children acquiring a range of different languages um, in naturalistic interactions. And I counted the number of times that children produced um, onomatopoeic words, such as woof woof, um, quack quack, and they're what I call equivalent conventional words. So dog and duck. So I compared the number of times they produced woof woof with the number of times they produced uh, dog, the number of times they produced quack quack with the number of times they produced uh, duck and so on. We can see uh, the results um, in this graph here. So the number of times the children produce the words is shown on the y-axis, the number of tokens. The number of onomatopoeia is shown in orange with the orange circles and conventional words in green. And each circle represents a different child and each child is connected. So their conventional onomatopoeic words are connected with the gray lines. Um, so we can see then that across, um, not, not consistently, but pretty much across the board, most children are pro uh, pro producing more onomatopoeia than they are conventional words. So it seems that, um, that, that, that when it comes to children's production, they're actually producing these more often in their early speech. So now we can zoom in a bit and have a look at how the children produce the words to see if that can give us some clues as to why they might be so common in infants' productions. Um, so I'm going to, um, I've got the phonetic transcriptions here, but I will read them out in case you're not familiar with, um, with reading phonetic transcriptions. But I'm going to start by looking at the, the uh, words related to dog. And I've just picked a couple of examples from the data to demonstrate this. So Lily produces dog or doggy as duddy and woof as uff. Laura produces doggy as goggy and woof as wow wow. And a child known as M produces dog as da and woof woof as bow wow. So here we can see that um, doggy, but none of the children produce doggy in a target like way. So they either reduplicate the syllable or they simplify the word to one syllable. So duddy, goggy or da. But woof woof, we could say is actually pretty accurate across the board. Um, none of the children say woof woof, but they pronounce, they produce it in a way that sounds much like a dog sound. And just to um, 
to help what I want to say about this is that these words, the onomatopoeia, we're much more flexible in how we interpret an onomatopoeic word as being target-like. Whereas we have one um, strict way in which we should produce the word dog or doggy, onomatopoeia can often be produced in different ways. And we would still say that the child has got it pretty, pretty correct, pretty spot on. And the same goes if we look at the word cat. So M produces cat as ka and Naima, who we'll be meeting later, as ka ka ka. And both of them produce meow as mao. So again, cat isn't that accurate for either of the children, but meow sounds kind of like the sound a cat makes, right? Like meow. And finally, if we look at duck, and both children, uh, M and Maria, produce duck as da, and then M produces quack quack as cack and Maria as Kaka. So while they're not producing the, although the, um, Maria is actually acquiring English and Estonian, um, but anyway, while, while these children are not producing quack quack, they're simplifying the word, but it still sounds like a duck sound. Now, from these examples, I don't think there's a really strong argument to suggest that onomatopoeia are particularly easy to produce compared with conventional words. If we look just at the actual ad adult targets, but we can see that they're at least equally as producible with their simple articulation requirements and with duplication. But most importantly, we can be flexible with how we interpret um, an onomatopoeic sound. So we can see an onomatopoeic word as being um, understandable even when the child doesn't produce it um, or, or being target-like even when the child doesn't produce it in the kind of um, orthographic form. So I think this gives us a good idea of why children might produce onomatopoeia, but um, we probably get a better idea of this when we observe actually how children produce these words. So I want to show some examples of this now. So this is my favourite um, example of a child producing onomatopoeia. Um, it's a child called Naima, who is one year and one month of age. And in the recording, we can hear the child producing a number of onomatopoeic words, and you can see the transcript um, there as well. What's really interesting here, though, is the way she produces them. So I want you to have a listen to that, if you hopefully can hear it properly, um, and uh, listen to how she's actually producing the onomatopoeia. <laughs> of those examples um, very shortly but I just want to point out here that the phonological forms the child produces are very simple you can see them in the transcript they're just simple uh, vowel sounds in most cases and the hoo 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 for a dog and an owl but the use of extra linguistic effects such as pitch, pitch changes allows the child to produce a whole a, a wide much a much wider variety of words and perhaps allows her mother to understand what she's saying more easily so we can see here that the, the forms are phonologically flexible and also can be modified using prosody. So what this clip also gives us is a really interesting example of an early interaction. So this got me thinking about how onomatopoeia might support children's early interactions with their caregivers. Um, um, interactions are quite tricky to acquire, or they, they, they in, they could be quite tricky to acquire because they, they require children to um, get the timing of interactions right, the turn-taking um, um, routine. They also need the child to combine social, pragmatic and linguistic competence. So I propose that onomatopoeia might allow children to rehearse interactions across the social, pragmatic and linguistic components when their production capacity is limited. So that's the important point I want to make here, that onomatopoeia can be produced despite limited production capacity. So I want to just show three examples of some early interactions from the data I've been using now, just to highlight different ways in which onomatopoeia can, can be useful in interactions. 
The first is taken from a child called Lily, age one year and one month. The mother says, is that a bear? Waits for the child to respond and she doesn't. So the mother then says, what does a bear say? Then the child responds with a simple vowel, ah, and the child, mother repeats, ah. So early on in her development, um, Lily's production capacity is limited, but we can see how the mother is engaging the child in an interaction by asking questions. The child doesn't respond, but is able to repeat the mother's very simple production of a bear sound, uh, sorry, and that she's able to produce a very simple production of a bear sound, which the mother then consolidates through repetition. The next child is William, age one year, four months. So they're looking at a picture book. The mom says, what's that? Pointing to a dog. The child says, dirty, doggy. The mother says, doggy, what does the doggy say? And the child responds, mm, which is woof or dog sound. So here we can see the child responds to the mother's questions and engages in turn taking. Um, onomatopoeia then allows them to expand on the topic by saying something about the dog rather than just labeling the dog. And again, we can see a simple uh, production here of the woof which um, equates to a dog sound. Finally, another example from Lily, um, age one year, four months. What does a doggy say? The child says, uff. The mother says, uff. The child says, uff. And then the mum says, woof. So in this example, we see a combination of turn-taking, repetition, and of course, asking questions. The child is able to respond fully to the mother, and the mother then consolidates this production through repetition. But note that she repeats the child's production of the form first, and then goes on to produce the, the sort of more target-like production. So finally, I want to return to a couple of final examples from the child I showed before, Naima, that I think bring together the reason why onomatopoeia are important in interactions. We'll start with the owl. Yeah. What's an owl say? I know an owl, not a dog. So hopefully here you can see how important the use of prosody is. So that is the pitch of the sound. Um, the child starts by producing the owl sound at a low pitch, which the mother identifies as a dog. And then she says an owl, not a dog. And then the child adjusts her pitch to produce it in more like an owl-like pitch. Um, so here we can see how actually the use of prosody in onomatopoeia is meaningful. Using a different pitch changes what the child is communicating. So the, the, actually the phonological form is exactly the same. It's just the overlying um, pitch characteristics that make that, that form understandable. What about frog? Frog? Again, another example how the use of pitch sort of contrastive here. It um, differentiates uh, one sound that might re represent one animal to another, which is the frog. She also uses rhythm here to make that very, very simple phonological form um, meaningful. So here we see the importance of iconicity. The sound effects the child is using are iconic. They're inherent to the meaning of the form, so much so that you can't change the sound effects. If you do, you get a different meaning altogether. So we can see how the iconicity of the form can support the child's production of onomatopoeic words, allowing her to draw on prosody as a production resource when her production capacity is otherwise very limited. So returning to my final question, well, my first question, does iconicity help children learn words? Yes, I think it does across lots of domains. Um, but what I want to propose is as well as the, the close four meaning links that have been proposed to be important here, they offer lots of really important things for early production. They're articulatorily very accessible. They're useful material for very early interactions. They allow children to practice turn-taking. And they also um, offer a positive feedback loop from early production to early interaction, which in turn um, supports children to um, further develop their production skills. So I think the reason there are so many onomatopoeia in infants' early words is because they tick lots of boxes when it comes to early phonological development. So I think that's it from me. Thank you very much. Thanks, Catherine. And we have about four minutes for questions. Um, so please feel free to ask questions in the Q&A. Um, so let's see, we have uh, a question. When words are iconic, are there any particular sounds that are associated with certain meanings? So say certain sounds for big versus small. Yes. 
Yes, that's a great question. Um, researchers are having an absolute field day discussing how different sounds relate to different meanings. It's uh, really a big conversation right now. And um, Claire used the example of big and small. Um, what we tend to find is words that are um, that contain sort of sounds that make your mouth, your vocal tract smaller. So e, u, um, tend to be related to um, smaller things. And I, I said e there, that's probably not good, but e tends to be related to small things and r and or tend to be related to big things. So like tiny versus huge, for example. Um, there's also some research that's shown that Words for rough tend to include, across different languages, tend to include uh, r sounds, so either r or r or r. Um, so yeah, there's there's lots of um, systematic correspondences across different languages, and there's lots of research to show that that is the case. Uh, then Vicky Joyce asks, has any research been done into the role of onomatopoeia in later language acquisition? Uh, she says, for example, my three-year-old apparently hissed at a child at preschool yesterday to show she was upset. Uh, she says, though possibly the impression of Scarface Claw from Harry McClary. I'm not familiar with that one, but you might be. <laughs> no, I'm not familiar either, but it sounds kind of scary. <laughs> <laughs> not that I'm aware of the research is quite limited to um, earlier development, but there are lots of studies that show that slightly older children are really responsive to um, sound meaning correspondences. Um, and I don't see why it should be um, restricted to, to very young babies, because I think, um, as, in, as in your example, children can draw on lots of different resources to communicate. And I think that they're perhaps less constrained by the expectations of, of kind of like kind of, 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 of grammar than, than, than adults are. But that being said, even adults use lots and lots of onomatopoeia in speech, often to express things. So we might be talking about marmite, for example, and be like, oh, because we want to use kind of sounds to um, explain how we feel about something when we may be lost for the exact words to describe that. So I don't think it's limited by age at all. Mm -hmm. And uh, then can it sometimes be difficult to tell whether a child's acquired a word when some of their productions are quite similar? Um, mm -hmm. So the example here is whether, say, the child's two pronunciations of who could, like a who sound, could represent two different animals, possibly. Yeah. Um, yeah. So again, this is a really good question. And again, one that um, researchers are having a great time trying to figure out, but I don't think we've really got the answer yet of how to know exactly when a child has acquired a word. Um, um, it, it can be extremely ambiguous, and I think even in like, so the data that I use is transcribed, so people who are not me have decided what the child is saying, and I'm glad I, I don't have to do that job, because <laughs> I think it's very hard. Um, I think parents often know better than, than researchers when looking at the data. Um, but yeah, children often will produce lots and lots of different words in the exact same way in early development. Um, and then it's a matter of kind of um, weeding out the differences between them to make them more and more um, distinguishable over time. Actually, that's my current research project is looking at that. I don't have the, the exact answers yet. And it's a really interesting problem to be dealing with in research. Brilliant, yeah. Um, so I think that's all we have time for. So thank you, Catherine, again, for your talk. And um, next, we uh, will go to George Bailey, who's our final speaker. Um, so I'll ask George to share the screen and uh, I'll introduce him. So George is a lecturer in sociolinguistics in our department and he teaches models in sociolinguistics and phonetics and phonology. And he's going to present his work on the graphical representation of phonetic dialect on social media. Um, my pleasure to be here and to be talking about what I think is a really cool topic um, about how people represent the phonetic characteristics of their own dialect on social media. Um, I'm going to start off briefly by outlining the kind of broad areas of interest that I think are relevant for this talk. So firstly, uh, linguistic diversity and with a particular focus on regional variation. So really asking the question, you know, are there regional patterns of language use in informal writing? Um, and do they correspond to the 
the same dialectal patterns that we see in spoken language. Um, secondly, language use on, on social media and of course, computer mediated communication in its broader sense. Um, so, you know, are people actually representing their own spoken dialect on social media? And if so, how are they doing that as well? Um, and then finally, the results also speak to questions about language attitudes and the role of language in constructing and projecting some kind of social or regional identity. Um, hopefully I'll have some time at the end to uh, talk a bit about that. So there's of course lots of factors that influence how we speak. I'm sure you're all aware of that. Um, and the formality of the situation that we find ourselves in is you know, a major one. So we're all always involved in a constant process of style shifting, changing the way we speak, depending on what we deem to be appropriate in a given context. Um, and generally speaking, we are just likely to use fewer non-standard or stigmatized forms in more formal situations. And we can think about that across a range of different linguistic categories. So we can talk about lexical variation, you know, the, the words that we choose to use in any one instance. Um, phonetic or phonological variation, so properties of the sounds in those words. Um, and then also syntactic or grammatical variation, uh, which is basically, you know, the way we put those words together to form meaning. Um, and to give just a few examples, you know, of these, so lexical variation, you might think of people using the word friend as opposed to mate or pal. Uh, for phonetic variation, we might think about people saying city or city. Um, and in terms of grammatical variation, we might think of people saying they were, um, or the kind of more non-standard, uh, they was. Obviously not an exhaustive list, um, but these are probably the three main areas of variation that's often focused on in research into language variation and change. Uh, and that paradigm is usually applied to spoken language, um, but we can also analyze variation in written language through the same lens. Uh, and social media in particular is a great place to do that. It's a great place to look for linguistic diversity. It's obviously highly informal, so we might expect, you know, just a lot more of that variability of the type I've just been talking about. People more likely to flout the conventions of, of standard language use uh, when they're tweeting. Uh, and it's also in particular a great place to look for things like lexical innovations. Um, and that kind of came up in the teaser video if you've watched that on the Toolkit website. People using words like fleek and, and football and rect and so on. Um, but also creative use of spelling. Um, and, you know, more recently, kind of the, the tension between punctuation and emoji use, which has often been the focus of discourse on youth language and internet language um, in recent times. Um, and it's this notion of creative spelling that I'll be focusing on today. Because if we think back to those three categories of variation that I outlined uh, on the previous slide, lexical, phonetic, and grammatical, uh, with written language, we might think it's impossible to analyze phonetic variation. You know, that would rely on us having spoken data, recorded language, actual audio files to analyze. But what we can do is look closely at orthographic variation instead. And in particular, the way that spelling choices can reflect interesting phonetic properties of, of the spoken word. So that's the study I'll be talking about today. It's something I was involved in a couple of years ago, uh, recently published in a volume on dialect writing, specifically in the north of England. Um, so I'll just spend a minute or so introducing this concept of dialect writing before going through the main results. Um, it has very traditional roots in dialect literature. So, you know, obviously the study I'll be talking about today is a much more modern spin on that, um, but it is a very traditional thing. And as the name suggests, it's the representation of a non-standard dialect in writing. And that can take many different forms. It might involve the use of regionally specific words. A great example is, you know, variation in the, what we call a bread roll. You know, people call it a, a roll, a bat, bam, muffin, cob, batch, tea cake. I think that's an, a relatively exhaustive list. Um, so, you know, that's a great example of, of lexical variation. Um, but it might also involve things like uh, kind of dialectal grammatical structures or even dialectal respellings that reflect the phonetic characteristics of how those words are actually pronounced by these speakers. And that's, of course, the main focus of this talk. Um, it's found across a range of texts. So we see it in poetry, in novels, cartoons, and as we'll see shortly, in tweets as well. Um, and the reason why it's an interesting topic is that by studying dialect writing, 
it kind of lends insight into a number of interesting issues. So when dialects are represented in this way, it tells us something about the kind of cultural prominence of different linguistic features. You know, what are the things that people call upon, uh, you know, writers, to authentically portray a certain dialect? Um, and we also learn a bit about this idea of dialect and registerment uh, more generally. So, you know, essentially a process where a linguistic repertoire, a kind of a, a way of speaking, becomes a socially recognized register of forms. And, you know, a really extreme example of that is when you see certain dialects being stereotyped in the media or kind of commodified in the form of, of tourist souvenirs, you know, car stickers, T-shirts, things like that. Um, so this is just like one extension of that process. Um, so here's a, like a, a, I guess, a traditional example. It's a picture I took um, from a Peter Liu exhibition in Manchester a few years ago. Um, and it's a story written in this kind of dialect literature manner. So we see lots of features. Um, I'll have to take a guess at what the writer was intending, the actual sound, but we see things like the word there being spelt like there, um, holding being spelt like uh, holding or holding, um, right as reet, um, our as ewer. Um, we see reduction of and just to an, and you know, plenty of other examples, shouting for shouting. Um, we see vowel differences like tast and gav for taste and gave. So like I say, that's a very traditional example and there's, there's plenty of, um, of resources like that, like I say, poetry and also uh, literature as well. Of course, today I'm more interested in things like this. This is an example of a real tweet, um, which was sent to Angela Rayner. Um, so something like, hey up Angela, thou won't take no notice of them soft southern jesses. If that speaks with flat vowels, that's how it's considered thick. Um, great example, obviously, with a lot of different features in there. Um, so they're the kind of things we're looking at today. So the research question essentially is to what extent the users of social media project their own dialect in social media posts, uh, with a focus on Twitter, obviously, for now. Um, and do these dialects and features show the same regional profile in writing as they do in speech? Uh, and to answer that question, we collected a lot of data. So we got um, 183 million tweets, all tagged with the exact latitude and longitude of where that person was in the world when they sent that tweet, uh, which is kind of a bit creepy, but that data is collected sometimes by Twitter. I think most people have it turned off now. Um, and that equates to almost 2 billion words. So, you know, a massive amount of data here. Um, the book chapter itself, um, covers 11 phonetic variables. I'll only talk about a handful today. Um, so these are variables that were chosen carefully, really just to make sure that it's possible to reflect the dialectal sound in the spelling, which isn't always the case for all phonetic features. Um, that's a topic that comes up in the classroom tasks that are available on the toolkit website. Um, and these are all features which, you know, we know what to expect. If these are genuine kind of dialect uh, phonetic forms, we know the kind of regional profile that they should show on Twitter. Okay, so the first example uh, is the T to R rule. And this is people who say Gera instead of Getta or Laura instead of Lotov. Um, any other instance as well, where basically you get a T at the end of a word and uh, the next word is kind of an unstressed vowel like A or something. Um, in speech, it's characteristic of Liverpool English. It's also found in Tyneside. And this is the map of the Twitter data. So the, the darker the color, uh, the more frequent the non-standard spelling. And we can see a, a similar kind of regional pattern here. So a concentration of the non-standard, you know, Gera, Laura um, in Liverpool, just over here, and also in the Northeast, going down the Eastern coastline, a bit into the Midlands as well. It's certainly less frequent in the South of England. Um, there's some example tweets below. I'll put them up for every feature so you can look at those. So things like um, so much for revising Delia, get it off Twitter. Um, one thing to notice is that overall, this is quite rare. So you might uh, have noticed on this legend here, the postcode area where it's most frequent, it's still only used 1.1% of the time. So, you know, it's not massively common, which is why we need a lot of data to look at this. Um, but that makes sense, really, because, you know, we're dealing with the written medium here, the strict constraints of those spelling conventions that don't apply in the same way when we're actually speaking. And it's a common theme across these results. We're looking at relative differences between areas, even if the overall kind of absolute frequencies uh, are quite low across the board. And I will try and return to that point later. 
Another northern feature is the retention of the long oo vowel in words like mouth and house and down, any word with that ow vowel, basically. Um, so it's people saying mooth instead of mouth or doon instead of down. Um, it's, again, said to be characteristic of Tyneside, but also Scots as well. And we absolutely see this here in the Twitter data. Um, it's been said also that it's especially frequent in words that kind of enact a local identity. So in Newcastle, um, words like toon for town or brune for brown in reference to um, Newcastle brown ale. And we see an example below of it being used in that kind of context. So someone referring to the, the dune toon bantar. Um, and like I say, on the Twitter data in our map here, it's very, very clear that it's most frequent in Scotland and particularly in the Northeast. Um, and to an extent, Northern Ireland as well. Um, so it does suggest, again, that we're seeing this being used by the same people who would be using it in their spoken form, uh, and therefore a genuine case of dialect writing in this case. Uh, one other feature, and it's another Northern feature, um, this time it's restricted specifically to Manchester. So it's what we call happy Latin. Um, and again, happy is this lexical set, so it refers to not just the word happy, uh, but any unstressed, a vowel at the end of a word. So it could be happy, it could be city. Um, and there's already variation in that vowel throughout the UK. Some people uh, have a, a kind of tensor vowel, more like happy. Other people have a laxer vowel, more like happy. Um, but in Manchester, a lot of speakers have a, a much laxer vowel where the tongue is even lower in the mouth, uh, more like an e sound. So something more like sitter, happy, um, which is very characteristic of Mancunian accents. Um, and again, on Twitter, we see the expected pattern. So it's not clustered too strongly around Manchester, but we definitely see it uh, used frequently there. I think, I think that's Manchester. I should know I'm there now. Um, and interestingly, we actually see the highest rates in particular for the word city. Uh, and it's a highly salient feature of the local Manchester accent. Uh, so it's kind of no surprise that it might be encoded in the word city and in stereotypes of people who support Manchester City Football Club, basically. Um, and what's interesting is that, you know, like I say, it's used a lot in Manchester, also kind of the surrounding areas in the northwest. We do see it elsewhere as well, particularly around London, actually, which is interesting. And what's cool is that we've looked into this in a bit more detail. And a lot of those cases where it's been used by people outside of Manchester, it's kind of specifically the word city. So it could be related to that cultural stereotype. It could be users uh, on Twitter who are probably Man City fans all over the country using this spelling to index that kind of footballing allegiance, even if it's not actually a feature of their own spoken dialect. But again, we see it um, extended to other words, so things like, uh, oh yes, yeah, so happy to be eating chicken nugs, which I assume is a, a truncated form of chicken nuggets. Um, now you might be thinking at this point, hold on, these are all Northern features. So is it not just a case of like Northern Twitter users in general being more likely to tweet in a kind of non-standard way? Um, but this is a variable with closer ties to the south of England. This is TH stopping, which is the realisation of the and the sounds as the plosives to and de instead. So people are saying den instead of then or ting instead of thing. And of course, Paul Kersville was talking about this uh, with reference to multicultural London English before. Um, it does have its origins in MLE, but it's also been claimed that the form has kind of generalised. It's now a wider characteristic of the performance of ethnic identity or of urban varieties more generally, as opposed to being a quite restricted regional marker. Uh, now, in terms of our Twitter data, we do see a clear pattern emerge. So it's very much used you know, frequently in the south, uh, in the southeast around London. But you see, it, do, it is creeping up into the Midlands around here, um, around Birmingham especially. And you know, we know there are significant minority ethnic groups around there. And we see a small hotspot again in Manchester here which would kind of support the idea that it's maybe less so a London-centric form, uh, maybe more now a feature of just kind of these, these urban varieties. Um, and notice again in these examples, a really interesting thing is that we often see co-occurrence of multiple features together. So it's rarely just one feature appearing on its own. It's usually more a, a collection of phonetic spellings that are used in tandem uh, to contribute to this kind of portrayal of, of the spoken form. So we see uh, you know, lexical variation, fam, uh, this trip every day is just a long ting. So we've got a couple of th uh, stop in there. We've got TD deletion. Again, a very frequent form in speech where you kind of delete the 
the t or the d at the end of a word if another consonant comes before it. Um, and again, uh, D's man, just, TD deletion again, vexing my life. So it's really interesting that we often see these, a lot of different features co-occurring uh, together. Uh, one of the more common phonetic spellings is actually the dropping of the G in words like eating, running, laughing, etc. Um, it's a feature that's been attested all over the world in, in loads of varieties of English. And it's usually a strong social marker. So linked to things like social class, level of education, age or gender. Um, in the UK, it's been claimed that it's more of a regional variable than a social variable. Um, so northerners and, and people in Scotland, especially using the G dropped form a lot uh, more frequently than the rest of England uh, and the UK. And that's quite interesting. It mirrors the historical origins of that variable from hundreds of years ago, which is quite cool. Um, and we see the same thing once again on Twitter. So we can see very much used uh, frequently in Scotland, uh, Northern Ireland, and in the Northwest in particular, not just the North of England, but the Northwest, uh, and very rare down South. Now, not all of the variables showed the expected pattern, um, but some interesting things crop up in those that don't. So there are two features here that I want to talk about, letter backing, which is another Mancunian feature, where people pronounce the kind of schwa vowel at the end of uh, words like Manchester, more like O, oh, um, and also words like letter, hence why we call it letter backing. So these people would say something more like letter, Manchester. Um, and also the foot strut split, which is a real north south divide in England. And so southerners pronouncing words like um, bus and cut, more like um, bass and cut, and people in the north saying things more like bus and cut. Um, and again, it's a feature that can be registered in the place name where that feature is typically associated. So uh, Manchester and uh, London. And in these cases, it looks like we actually see the opposite pattern. So we see with the kind of the London spelling, it's actually used less frequently in the Southeast compared to the rest of the country. And for Manchester, I mean, there's just no real pattern there. It is used a bit around the Northwest, but no clear um, cluster in there. So it looks like we see in the case of dialect imitation, which is why the cropping up in places we don't expect. Um, it's people kind of imitating the dialect and, and that effect is registered most strongly in place names that are associated with that dialect. Um, and again, another great example of co-occurrence of features here. Um, apparently I sound like I'm from South London when I'm drinking. Um, so you've got the, the vowel difference, a very kind of cockney um, R vowel, the, the monophongization there. We've got TH fronting, the th going to a th. And of course, we've got the, the strut vowel in London as well. Okay, um, I'm gonna skip this because I going to go over, I'm aware of the time. Um, we can also talk about it in the questions. If you're interested, just a few kind of caveats when we work with this kind of data. Um, but what we've seen here is a really clear pattern. We've seen a strong parallel between the written and the spoken forms of these dialect features. Um, and that's really reassuring. We've seen genuine cases of phonetically motivated orthography, which shows that that process of dialect enregisterment that I talked about earlier, you know, and that's been attested in, in literary and artistic contexts, it, this is kind of being used with similar purposes by the speech community on social media platforms. And it's interesting because it tells us something quite cool about the salience of these features, you know, the, the social prominence, the fact that these features are being used as stereotypes of a dialect, presumably with the intention that readers will see the forms being used and understand what kind of spoken features the writer was trying to convey. Um, and in doing that, you know, we learn a lot about how people utilize these features in a socially meaningful way to construct and project a linguistic and a social identity. And that's what we mean by, you know, identity construction. It's not just the use of language to communicate some information, but the use of particular features to communicate something about who we are and how we want to be perceived as well. So very quickly, I want to just make a point about language attitudes. I mean, unsurprisingly, a lot is made of youth language and how social media is destroying the English language, which, you know, is untrue. Uh, but it's a widespread misconception. You don't have to look too far to find quotes and headlines like these. Um, I won't read them out. They're there for you on the slide. But the important point is that, in this case at least, these social media violations of spelling conventions um, and no different to the kind of traditional forms of dialect writing and poetry we've seen for hundreds of years. The only difference here is that, you know, it's young people doing it on their phones, hence the criticism. Um, and, you know, some of the most celebrated literary works of all time. Um, so in Wuthering Heights, uh, we see the character Joseph and this representation of 
19th century Yorkshire dialect features. Uh, yeah, good for nout. I was sure he'd serve you out. There were nout like this when I were a lad and so on. It's the same thing. Um, and just to prove my point, I actually lied to you all. Um, two of these features aren't from Wuthering Heights at all, but they're actually real tweets from our data set. But hopefully that wasn't obvious to you, which kind of proves the point. It, it's the same thing. It's, it's creative use of language uh, to index certain social meanings and to project this identity that would otherwise be masked if we were conforming to, you know, the standard conventions of, of written language and spelling. And, you know, if it's good enough for Emily Bronte, then it's good enough for the rest of us, I would say. So final take home message then is that informal mediums like Twitter and others are a real hotbed of linguistic innovation and diversity and creativity. Um, and I've shown today that we've got very strong evidence for saying that people choose to create and broadcast social media posts that are written in a way which more closely reflects their own spoken accent. And this variation in spelling then, you know, it's a violation, yeah, of the kind of strict conventions of, of spelling, but it's orderly and systematic. And it has nothing to do with a laziness or a decline in the English language. It just represents an obvious form of identity construction that we already see in spoken language. And it's more obvious because it's something we can see with our own eyes. It requires a much more deliberate and conscious action to type the words in this way compared to some of the variation we see in speech, which might be a bit more below the radar. Um, and that itself is interesting. It tells us something about you know, the intentions of the user. Okay, that's everything. Thanks for listening. Well, thanks for listening, I should say. Thanks, George. Um, we have about two minutes for questions. So um, there's one coming from Jill Beckwith, who asks, why do you think there are so many instances of Geroff and Happy Lacks in, in London when we associate these with the North? Is it just density of population with some Northerners living and working in London, or is it that they're maybe mocking or asserting a Northern identity in a kind of performative way? Yeah, that's a really good point. You know, and obviously it kind of links to what I was saying about that issue of dialect imitation, and we do see some examples of that. Um, Without looking at the data closely, it is hard to say. Um, obviously, with it being London, it's very likely that this could just be Northerners who have moved down south or are just in any one instance, you know, tweeting from London, they might be there for the day. And that's kind of one of the issues which I didn't have time to talk about um, on the, the kind of limitation slide, but we have a lot of data, but obviously one issue with that is there's a lot of noise in the data and we don't know for definite, just because someone tweets from a certain place, doesn't mean that they were, you know, they lived and were brought up there and speak the dialect of that area. Um, so it, it could be either. It could be dialect imitation. It could be people who have, have moved to London. Um, and yeah, I mean, it, it's interesting because we know languages change through face-to-face -face contact and, and population movement and so on. Um, so, you know, maybe if enough of us move to London, we might see it become a London feature as well. Who knows? And then uh, Kelly Homer asks, do you think we might eventually see this phonetic dialect in extended formal prose pieces, e.g. Whole, novel, whole novels written in a Mancunian dialect? Possibly. I mean, you know, it, it depends on the, on the author's intentions. And, you know, it, there's a reason people write in this way, obviously. It, you know, there's a reason that Joseph Carrick's in Wuthering Heights was written in that way to, to reflect something about that person and, you know, the kind of character that the author wanted to, to construct. Um, so yeah, it is very possible we could see entire novels written in that way. There may be examples of that already. Um, obviously the one issue with it is that, like I said earlier, not every feature can be reflected in that way. So you have to be careful of what features to actually look at. Um, and the other issue is that, you know, there's, you have to think of transparency, I suppose. So by doing that, are you kind of um, excluding certain audiences who may not be able to actually work out what's being said? Um, if you're a speaker of that dialect, it might be quite easy, but if you're not as familiar, it, it's not always clear, you know, what the author was trying to convey. So that's why, like I say, you, not, not every feature can be represented in this way. Um, but I mean, I for one would love to read a book that's written <laughs> fully in a Mancunian accent. Why not? Yeah, you, you could understand it, no problem. Yeah, maybe. <laughs> Brilliant. Thank you, George. Um, so thanks, everybody, for the questions. Please do keep them coming in and any that don't get answered here, we can um, get our speakers to answer uh, on our website later. Um, so we now have, uh, I think, three minutes, if I'm right, um, yes, three minutes left um, till our next talk. So we have a three minute break and we'll start again with Dan's 
talk wrapping things up for us at 4.25. Um, in the meantime, I'll just take a few minutes to advertise um, something to you. So I'll just share the screen uh, for that. Um, so you might have seen on our uh, registration page for the workshop that we have uh, a new, well, I say new, it's the third run of it, um, but we have soon to launch on Monday, a third run of our Accents, um, Attitudes and Identity MOOC, which stands for Massive Online Open Course. Um, it's an introduction to source linguistics. Uh, as I say, it launches on Monday. You can still sign up. It's completely free. Um, if you click this link, you'll see something like this, and you can watch the intro video about it. And you just sign up um, at this link, and it takes you to um, the, the platform that, that it's going based at Future Learn. Um, so it lasts four weeks, and uh, I'm one of the facilitators on the course, along with um, Heather Turner, who's been helping us today, uh, Sam Helmuth as well, uh, Dom Watt, uh, and also uh, Sarah Lafplas. We will be on the course for that four week duration, answering any questions you have. Um, so please do have a look. Um, it is aimed at both teachers and students. So we'd love it if you encourage your colleagues or um, students to sign up. Um, and it's ideal for any students who are thinking of studying English language or linguistics at university. And there are also some taster sessions uh, which you can access on this link. And these are free um, permanently basically uh, without any kind of registration. So if you don't sign up for the MOOC, you can still access these or at least they can give you a taster of what is in the MOOC um, because these are selected um, sections of the MOOC itself. Um, so we have coverage of, for instance, um, the Accent Bias Britain project, which Dominic Watts involved with, um, more on Multicultural London English with Paul Kurzweil, and some um, other articles and um, case studies relating to accents and identity and um, practical applications of, of research in say courtrooms and classrooms and things like that. So we'd really love it if you um, joined us on that. And it is available beyond the four week facilitation period as well. So if you can't make it and sign up later, you're still able to access the course beyond that uh, four week period. So I will stop sharing. And um, I think we're on to uh, our next talk. So I'll ask, Dan now uh, to share his screen. And while he's doing that, I'll hand back to Sam who'll take us into the last section for today. Excellent, thanks. Um, well, Dan is gonna appear, turn his camera on in a moment, I hope, so we can see him as well as hear him. Um, Dan needs no introduction to an audience of English language teachers, um, but we're very grateful again to him for giving his time to contribute to this uh, webinar. As many of you will know, Dan has um, extensive experience um, in teaching English language A-level as an AQA senior examiner, writing textbooks, writing the English language blog, contributing to English EMC, um, magazine, workshops, conferences, all of that, and as one of the masterminds behind the Lexis podcast. Um, but Dan's now going to take us through how you can take the research you've heard about this afternoon and put it into practice in your teaching. Well, th thanks very much, Sam, and um, thanks for asking me back. It's always fun to uh, to do these, um, and I think I probably learnt more uh, in the last couple of CPDs at York than I did when I was actually a student at York. But that's <laughs> that's probably my fault, first time round. But um, also, it's just uh, it's just fascinating to see all the work that's that's going on. Um, okay, so just going to uh, move on. I think I think one of the things is sort of this this job for me gets easier each time because um, I think one of the things that we we can see is that through um, lots of the presentations um, there are some really clear links to things that we do on the A level. Um, so it's it's really nice to see that, and I think particularly at the end where George was kind of showing some of the the sort of links to uh, different aspects of 
um, regional identity, language attitudes, and things like that. It makes it, it it's it's really clear to see. And so I think my job my job's increasingly easy with this. Um, but also, it's you know it's fascinating to to get a glimpse of what's going on and to, to have a think about the sort of connections that can be made. I think it's also worth thinking about um, our sort of role as English language teachers at A level. Um, you know, there's always a core of case studies and research that we come back to as A-level teachers, but I think we can we can keep adding to that and we can keep building our own knowledge base um, as we look at some of the work that's being done here and in previous years. Um, and it's really helpful to see where it all fits in and where we might be able to make links to what we do already. Um, it's also really encouraging, I think, to see how rapidly and effectively teachers and students make use of the material and feed it into their existing work. Um, and while there haven't been any exam papers to mark in 2020 and 2021, at least for examiners who work for exam boards, I know teachers have had to do masses of stuff with CAGs and everything this last year for no extra pay. So uh, that's uh, congratulations to people who've got through that. Um, but we can certainly see that kind of stuff working through um, in our own students' work. And it's always, I just think it's so encouraging to see students latch onto these ideas so quickly and embed them in the work that they do. Um, so it's it's great and I think that you know obviously part of that role is teachers coming on things like this and you know talking about the, this kind of work at conferences and on Twitter for example so um, yeah I mean I think one of the things I just wanted to sort of talk about before we look at each presentation and think about how each each one might be relevant for for the A-level um, is a sort of broader point as well really that you know we I think as teachers we really want to help students develop their knowledge and understanding for the A-level but also you know, they're not just doing it because of that. They're also doing it because I think, you know, we want them to be active, you know, thoughtful, critical members of society. We want them to be linguists as well, not just in the kind of narrow sense of going to university to, to study linguistics and language, but to be aware of language around them at all times. Um, and I think as well, um, for our own self-preservation, um, both in sixth form colleges and schools with running A-levels, but also in language and linguistics departments. We also need to convince more year 10 and 11 students to take A-level English language. And I think what's really useful about some of today's sessions and those in previous years is that we can you know, relate that work to what's gone before. We can see where it fits in with historic studies and the rest of it. But also, you know, we can see how it strikes out in sort of new and interesting directions. And I think we can also you know, feed that into something, we, we, you know, things that we do um, with our key stage three and key stage four students too, to give them a real taste of language study. I think as well, what's what's really interesting is, um, you know, many of these talks allow us to see some different angles. And I think particularly for this year's uh, presentations, I was really grabbed by this sort of idea of social meanings um, and how important that is to so much of the work that goes on. Um, you know, it opens up some real discussion about the different purposes of language. Um, and I think it perhaps sort of takes us away from one of the sort of more basic and reductive and more obvious views about language, that it's simply about communicating ideas, um, you know, from one person to another, if you like. Um, and actually that, you know, language is about communicating more than just that. It's about, um, you know, a conscious understanding of languages, maybe sort of signaling identity and communicating things like stance as well. Um, and I think there's also, you know, a lot of reminders today as in the presentations that, you know, the way in which we organize our courses and you know, the A-level specifications themselves needn't be a kind of straitjacket, needn't restrict us in our discussion of language. There are some really big overlaps between the topics we teach, and that's really worth remembering. And I think you know, um, many of the talks today sort of open up those, those overlaps and I think show us the sort of bigger picture of language study. Okay, so thinking about the sessions specifically, um, going back to session one with Paul Kurzweil, um, I thought the main link links here were clearly around language diversity and language change. Um, particularly, I was thinking these, these are mainly links for sort of AQA, but I think you can see that they, they translate to other specs too. Paper two around language discourses, that's mostly about sort of language attitudes, debates around language, but also, of course, for language investigations for the NEA. Um, and I think, you know, MLE has featured increasingly in work that students have done on language diversity. I think to the extent that it's probably one of the most frequently cited varieties, although it's not strictly a variety, in student responses. So it's 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 clearly captured students' imaginations. Um, and I think the work on MLE has served a really important role in challenging stereotypes around things like, you know, MLE just being slang or being some kind of, you know, broken English or ghetto talk. And I think students are very good at being able to respond to those kind of rather erroneous 
prescriptive kind of media representations of it. Um, and as Paul was saying about the sort of, you know, the, the sort of phasing out of Chafakin seems to be quite an interesting development. Um, people are much more ready to talk about this as MLE or increasingly, you know, M MBE or Multicultural Urban British English. Um, and I think what's really interesting as well is that, you know, Paul's presentation also shows us a significant language change dimension to this. Um, you know, illustrate some of the sort of key ideas and processes behind how language changes, e.g., you know, contact and demographics. Um, and I think that's a, a really important thing to, to emphasize with students is that, you know, just because they're studying MLE as part of perhaps, you know, language diversity, socialect, language and ethnicity, you know, like accent and dialect, for example, is not to forget that there's some really interesting dimensions there to change, you know, how change takes place. And they could often use a lot of this in the um, the ways in which they sort of link this through to um, arguments about you know patterns of change. Some connected work, I think, as well that might be relevant to this. I think the, the transcripts and audio of Big Zoo and Sophia, which you'll find in the material on the website. Um, I think was it Morrison? We had a uh, a uh, an extract from as well. They provide an accessible. Um, engaging way in for students when they're first looking at MLE. So identification of features, but also uh, an understanding of how those features carry social meaning as well and help to convey particular attitudes um, and aspects of identity. And I think a really, you know, great starter activity for year 12, or even, you know, if we're giving students in years 10 and 11 a taste of language, um, they can apply these sort of language methods to short structures of spoken language and they can have you know, real focus on how social meanings are created. I think as well, it opens up different um, uh, sort of avenues for students to explore. And I was kind of struck by one of the points and certainly this was sort of picked up in a sort of conversation on Twitter while this was going on as well. It was really interesting to see Paul talking about the sort of language heritage and history uh, around MLE and the significance of Caribbean, particularly um, Jamaican influences. And I think, with, you know, without kind of dwelling too much on football, although I will a bit later on, of course, um, is that it's, you know, it's, it's been really interesting thinking about sort of current England team and obviously that, you know, the significant sort of prominent role that players of Caribbean heritage have, have had in that team. But as several people have pointed out, you know, it, those from an Asian background are almost non-existent. Um, it would be really, really interesting, I think, to explore, you know, with students thinking about their own cultural backgrounds, um, particularly those, you know, from from Asian backgrounds to have a look at Asian influence on different UK accents and dialects and multi ethnolects um, and to explore those further. So I think it opens up some, some interesting research projects uh, for students there as well. So moving on to session two, Paul Drew's session, and I think, you know, the, referring to the work that he and Annie Irvin have done, um, I think the main li links there, of course, paper two, language diversity, particularly around occupation. But I thought as well, some really interesting links to how we might deal with spoken language with students from the beginning of the course and again you know language investigations so i think there are some quite obvious links here to the work many teachers would do on language and occupation so that might be part of you know language and social groups for example um, we might already be talking about things like specialist lexis and jargon institutional genres of talk that kind of thing power and relationships in workplace interactions you know discourse communities and those kind of ideas but I think as well, it, you know, as, as, as Paul was illustrating, there's some really interesting work can be done on the structure of occupational talk. You know, the strategies that operate beyond, you know, the word and the utterance level. Um, and we might look at those in, in other occupations too. And I think it's really interesting to kind of think about that in terms of, you know, how when we analyse spoken language, and, I, you know, I, I think I've fallen into this myself with my teaching of it sometimes, is, you know, being fixated on, on, the, on the features. Um, is perhaps sometimes to you know explore how meanings are constructed and co-constructed in interaction and to think about some of the sort of strategies that are at work and that was very clear from some of the data that Paul was looking at. I think as well um, you know there's, there, there are lots of connections to spoken language analysis across the whole course and I think there were some really nice models there um, for spoken language work in the NEA um, particularly you know on the language investigation we get many students, you know, whatever specification, um, analyzing data from interviews, conversations, debates. And I think that approach modeled by Paul and in the materials that you can, you can download afterwards, which give you some sort of extension tasks and activities, um, could be a really excellent way of introducing how 
you can talk about this sort of AO3 side of things about meanings and contexts and the AO1 together, but also how you can weave in some of that AO2 theoretical sort of conceptual knowledge about how spoken language works. And I think as well, that sort of power dimension is really interesting. So there's some good insights there into how power is exerted and resisted through language. Um, if, if you teach power looking at, you know, at things like instrumental, institutional, influential power, um, you might see some you know, clear examples in, in that data that's provided. And I think some really good ways of, of um, exploring that in more detail. Okay, so moving on to uh, session three, and I don't think there'll be any prizes for guessing, you know, which part of the course this is most useful for. Clearly, you know, child language development is, is the key focus here, but I, I was particularly taken with the, uh, the uh, early lexical development. And I just thought that, you know, for, for someone who's relied very heavily uh, in my teaching on Catherine Nelson's 1973 word lists, I think it will actually, you know, there's, there's some great stuff in what Catherine's talked about that could give us a real sort of um, up-to-date focus on that. And certainly some of the, the stuff in a moment we'll have a look at from, from you know, Word Bank um, could, could really help us sort of uh, bring that bang up to date. And we probably need to, I mean, that's quite old now, isn't it? There's 73 stuff. Um, I think as well, what, what was really interesting as well was this sort of overlaps between lexis and phonology. And I think that's something that's that's an important thing for students to explore. You know, we, we I, I don't know exactly how everybody teaches this, but certainly I've, I've tended to take a sort of framework by framework approach or maybe a sort of stage and framework approach to teaching spoken language development, where I've kind of talked about, you know, how you know, sounds are produced one week. I've gone more into kind of words and meanings another week thought about sort of you know syntax in the next stage a bit of maybe morphology after that and then pragmatics later on for example but i think what's really interesting here is it does show those overlaps you know the 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 onomatopoeia is clearly somewhere between you know words and sounds and or, or maybe a bit of both um and i think that then leads us into some other overlaps as well so areas such as you know um lexis phonology and interaction i thought it was really interesting what catherine was saying about you know, this this sort of quotation from um you know from one of her slides both caregivers and children use onomatopoeic words as a way to keep the conversation going so that importance of interaction on the social meanings again of some of those features of child language rather than just being sort of focused on you know what they are and where they are is looking at what they do and how they can be used so great if students are analyzing data um, as part of their exam and being able to comment about the meanings within that data and I think as well, some of the, um, you know, the uh, sort of connected work with this, I think some of the guidance in the uh, little video that Catherine's done that, to go with this as well, talking about how to use WordBank, that's that's really, really helpful, very, very clear, very helpful for teachers, I think, if we want to investigate that and prepare our own resources, but great for students too. Um, useful for sourcing new data examples, but also I think, you know, students could create their own searches from it. Um, and I think, you know, one of the main sort of, um, applications of that would be in language investigations and I think traditionally you know we tended to see students looking at stretches of interaction but I think it would be really interesting if students looked at a maybe a more corpus based approach um, you know they could explore patterns in data um, it wouldn't just be about kind of recording what children are saying in conversation but maybe exploring you know data from other sources and thinking about you know the stages that that children go through some of the you know that the, the sort of um moments that that children have in interaction with their with parents and caregivers and I think as well just one sort of fairly simple final point about that is that among all of the topics on the A level I think you know certainly from my experience you know child language development is one where we tend to see the most limited range of reference to case studies and theories it's generally the sort of old favorites um, and we see maybe you know a few more recent names crop up but um, you know I think the work here opens up plenty of sort of new frames of reference. Um, so some, some ideas there for the third session and I can't really um, avoid uh, talking about football because I was thinking with George Bailey's um, session, um, really interesting thing that I was just spotted on Twitter this morning, someone doing a kind of a Yorkshire accent for the Yorkshire polo, Calvin Phillips, um, was, a, was a great representation of what he was talking about. And as George was saying, I think, you know, one of the things that's that's really interesting about all of this is its links to language diversity and language change, but also, as he was saying, to spoken language and computer mediated communication. Um, 
you know, many students, you know, will will see sort of connections to you know, different parts of the course. I think it would make a brilliant transition activity for year 11 students to see more, more of what they could do on the uh, on the A level and beyond. Um, and I think some really clear connections to language diversity, as George himself was saying. Um, but also that sort of written blended mode inflection we don't often see when we're dealing with language diversity. So I think that's a really interesting dimension to it. I mean, I've tended to stick to teaching around, you know, mostly around the spoken spoken language for um, for diversity. But this gives us some really new and interesting opportunities to discuss other other forms as well, other modes. Um, some connections to language change, and I think you know, technology and language change. Um, as you know, as as we've often seen, technology has often been associated with you know, dialect leveling, seeing, you know, technology is perhaps making us all use the same language, but yet here's technology representing, preserving, spreading non-standard dialects. Um, and as, as George was saying as well, language discourses, attitudes around technology, decay, decline can be explored too. Um, and I think that sort of opens up some, some really interesting areas. Just a couple of points on sort of connected work as well. Um, it could be really great to do some of this connected to this on paper one, so early on in the course maybe looking at how we use one form of language to represent another. So, you know, how linguists transcribe speech using things like IPA, um, phonemic, you know, phonemic symbols, but also how we use I dialect and you know, what, that, what that does, how we might interpret that. Um, language investigations could also come out of this, exploring, you know, identity and attitudes. Mini projects could come out of this, I think, in the first year of the course too, leading into, you know, longer ones in the second year maybe getting students to kind of think about, you know, social media and dialect use as an introduction to the kind of work they could do later on. And I was just thinking about some other work that I've seen um, fairly recently um, at QMUL by Christian Ilbury, who's focused on how young people interact through WhatsApp group chats and how they represent their own kind of identity and sort of social identity through the language they use. So I think some, you know, some really clear connections there. Um, and I just thought there's a few kind of useful links there that might help with that, a few ideas around sort of uh, tweetolectology, as some people have called it, um, Twitterology as well. Some stuff that goes back about 10 years um, where linguists first started looking at it, but also some more recent ones and some really interesting ones looking at, for example, how African-American speakers and tweeters use it um, and some studies of kind of dialect uh, language distribution around the USA and the UK using tweets. Okay, so yeah, just to conclude, um, once again, some masses of material here. There's, there's even more on the website, and I would really encourage you to, to have a look through that. And you know, the index that Jill has put together um, has been really, really helpful for sort of mapping what's there to different specifications and, and you know, topics. It's great to go through that and see some of that. And, you know, just thanks very much to University of York, York Linguists for sharing all of this. It's, um, it's great to see it and hopefully, um, you know, teachers can make use of it um, in, you know, in, in weeks and months to come. So thanks very much. And I hope that's a useful sort of run through of some of it. Thanks very much, Dan. That's extremely useful. And just to uh, reiterate that all the recording of this and all the slides will go on the website as soon as possible, um, as, as, as soon as over the weekend, possibly. Um, so now we've got a bit of time. We've got a good five, ten minutes for some questions for Dan and also any other questions you might have for the rest of the panel. So have a think about those and put those in the Q&A uh, while we kick off with the first question. Um, so, Dan, um, a question, the first one we had was, um, can you suggest any sources for uh, of data for language investigations, so the NEA, or perhaps just a pointer on what makes good data for an NEA? Um, it's quite a broad question, isn't it? I mean, it, it depends a little bit on what, you, what you're going to do for your NEA. Um, and I think I think just th thinking about the child language stuff, I think one of the things that's, that's maybe interesting about that that comes from what um, Catherine's been talking about today is um, going beyond just using kind of transcripts and recordings of what children are saying and thinking a bit more about, you know, look looking at the data that's already been gathered by people and exploring corpus data might be an interesting dimension to that. Um, I mean, I think traditionally, you know, we've we've seen you know, students finding data from from all over, um, you know, recording interactions in, in classrooms, those kind of things, and then transcribing that, um, having a look at children's early written language, going back through their own, you know, books and going into schools and gathering, you know, material together for things like that. 
Um, but I think essentially, you know, and ideally, we probably want the students themselves to be to be the source of that data and to come up with their own sort of ideas for that. Um, I mean, I think, you know, there's, there's plenty in the stuff here today and in other, you know, in, in the previous year's sessions to to feed into that. Um, yeah, that's not it's not a particularly great answer that I'm afraid. <laughs> it's um, um, it's a good one. Um, there's one that's just come in on the Q&A I can see from Lisa. Thanks for your question, Lisa. Um, who says, um, uh, I think it's intellectually healthy and interesting and more accurate in terms of understanding how language works to have access to this more recent research and other more recent research. But what do the exam boards say and think about this, the recent, using recent research? I can't, I, I can't really talk for an exam board in any official no. capacity. Um, if I did, they would kill me. Um, okay. <laughs> I was going to say if I did, I'd lose my job, but I haven't, I haven't got a job at the moment with them because I've got no papers to mark. But, um, but I think. So I, yeah. I turn it around then yes. to, to save your bacon. Um, what's what's the safest way for teachers to to successfully and in, in expose students to recent research in a way that will for sure still meet the spec? I, I think it's about integrating it with what they do already, and I think that's probably that's that's the way I've certainly approached it and seen lots of other teachers using it is to kind of is to think about how you know recent research might kind of continue the sort of narrative of research that's been going on um and I was doing some stuff with students the other day where we were looking at um sort of waves sociolinguistic waves and we were looking at Penny Eckert talking about the sort of three waves and I was thinking there about how you know, a lot, lots of the recent work has been very much concerned with social meaning, about stance, about performance. And I do, I think that that's where some of the stuff today and, and more recently kind of fits in with that is to, is to think about, you know, what, what kind of study is this? Is this really saying that people who are of that background are using this kind of language feature? And it's not, is it really? And I think so much of the work that goes on now, including, you know, particularly thinking about sort of Paul Kurzweil and George Bailey things today, were, were very much to do with a kind of identity creation and and using sort of using language features to to create social meanings about different groups about themselves about you know maybe a mocking identity but maybe also sort of performing some aspect of their own and I, I think that's how I'd approach it is to integrate it into what you do already um, and I think the other the other side of it as well is that you know if students are using this to help them answer the question in any way shape or form as long as it's clear what they're doing with this research I think you know examiners like to see that and I think most teachers like to see that is to kind of think well oh I haven't come across this before that's really interesting what are they doing with it is it just a name that's dropped in or is it somebody who's really kind of wrestling with the question and finding a new bit of research that that gives them a kind of new insight into it and I think that's that's probably the way I'd approach it I would you know I'd I'd, I'd you know, I, I'm a bit of a sort of, I see a shiny new thing and I think, oh, that's great. But I know not everyone's the same. Um, and, you know, it's, it's one of those things where I think students have to sort of justify why they're using it a little bit by kind of making it serve the, the needs of the question they've been asked. Um, but also kind of linking it to, you know, things, things that they would, you know, previously have studied. So you might kind of, you know, show how, you know, Trudgill looked at ING and IN in, in you know, pronunciation in Norwich. But then you might look at how you know George was talking about how that particular feature is represented through spelling in tweets, and think about well, were they really looking at the same thing? Does it prove the same thing? And I think it's a it's a different dimension to it, isn't it? And I think it's you know that might be a sort of the example of how I might approach it is to kind of link it to an older research or link it to um, something like that. I hope that sort of helps answer that question. Um, if anyone else has got questions, don't hold back put them in the the q a um I'll, I'll take just one more question for you dan and then i think we'll sort of switch the whole panel on and yeah yeah so that you're not so much on the spot by yourself um so um a question we would have uh is for for you or possibly for anyone is can you suggest ways to keep up to date with new research so obviously we're going to say, oh, come to our, use our stuff, but you'll obviously be aware of lots of other things. What are your, your, your top I think recommendations? My, I mean, obviously York's one of the very best. 
Um, we'll pay you for that later. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I think I think you you pointed out some of the links with QMUL as well. Um, the, the linguistics research digest is brilliant, and I think they've Devyani Sharma uh, was saying there's some new posts on there in the last couple of months that are interesting. Um, I think that's that's great. The Teach Real English website is also is also really interesting for that. Um, I think there's, I mean, I think Babel magazine from Huddersfield is is excellent, and um, you know, e magazine clearly has, has got lots of things that I, you know, I'm, I'm duty bound to say that's got lots of good things in it as well. But I, th I you know, I think I think it's, there's there's a lot more around now than there there was ten years ago. Um, it's quite a well resourced day level now, and I think it's you know it's these kind of things, these events, ones like a, you know Lancaster as well, who've been doing some really great um, online uh, webinars and things like that. Um, yeah, so I think I think those kind of places, and I, I think we you know there's there's obviously sort of a growing social media presence of linguists, so I think are a very helpful and supportive bunch. So I'd, I'd re certainly recommend following people like Rob Drummond. Um, and you know, there's this. I, I know George is on there, and the York English Language Toolkit are on there as well. Um, and there's there's a lot of podcasts. I mean, obviously, there's there's the one we've been involved in, but there's one, other ones that have been going for much longer. So, Accentricity, um, you know, Lingthusiasm. You've got the Vocal Fries podcast, and I think you know that's that's lots of really interesting stuff there. Yeah, that's a great roundup. Um, and what we'll do afterwards is maybe in a tweet we'll try and put all of those in a thread so that people who are unfamiliar them with them can um, can find them. I'm going to ask the rest of the panel to put their cameras on now, if you'd be willing, but maybe stay um, stay muted until um, we, unless you actually want to say something. Um, and we'll take a couple of questions uh, for uh, the whole panel. Um, so um, this is a question for both Paul Kurzweil and for George. Um, you both discuss non-standard dialects, as it were. Um, have you any thoughts about what can be done to reduce the stigma for speakers of those dialects? That's an impossible question, but um, do your best. George or Paul Kurzweil. Um, yeah, I mean, there is a lot of work in that moment. Obviously, the accent bias project that... Um, that, that Don Watts involved in here at York um, kind of speaks to those questions as well. So um, I'm not sure the kind of tangible outcomes of that project, but I know that's obviously one thing that, that they're addressing. Um, I think more than anything, it's just kind of the, the more we talk about it and the more, you know, we do things that we're doing at the moment helps kind of spreading that word that, you know, this isn't a, we're not talking about kind of language deficit here. You know, there's, there is a standard, yeah, and that doesn't mean it's inherently better than the rest. Um, so I think just, yeah, spreading kind of awareness in that sense. And, and I feel like we we are moving in the right direction, slowly, maybe. Um, and like I say, I mean, Don Watt and that project will, will have more to say on that, but I know, I think their results kind of suggest that, you know, that it's it's kind of, it's not as bad as it used to be, at least. Yeah, I think, I think that's ahead, true. Paul. Things are not as bad as it, as it used to be. Um, things are not good always, on the other hand, but um, I think it's more, public discourse about accents and, and disadvantage and so on. But um, then you also hear about people, I suppose they're speakers of MLE actually, who say, right, we to get through our lives, we have to code switch. And by code switching, they mean switching to something quite RP-like. And I've heard them speak on, on the radio, um, young, young lawyers actually. And I sort of think, well, we, Good if they didn't have to code switch, but they do, and are very conscious of it. So there's still some work to be done, I think. A lot of work to be done. On the other hand, as George says, I mean, you know, we we don't want to impose our. I mean, a lawyer would wouldn't really want to impose their own background heavily on on their on their clients. So maybe in that particular sphere, it's it's sort of okay. Thank you. Whole, That's yeah. yeah. No, well, and I'm just going to plug. We've got a case study from last year's workshop on the on the website about the Accent Bias Britain project, and it includes all the unpacks all of the research that they've done. Um, I think we've got time for one more question, probably, unless another one comes in. This is a question for Paul Drew. 
Um, and again, it may not, it may be an impossible question. Sorry about that. So um, this was one that Elizabeth asked earlier, we didn't have time for, but we'll pick up on that now. Um, has the NHS changed the way they train staff as a result of the research that you've done? Um, that's not intended to be a criticism, but uh, no. how, is, how is it feeding back into practice? Uh, uh, not has changed, but is changing. That's to say, our project, the project that Annie and I did is really a sub part of a bigger program being coordinated by people at Manchester University. And they are um, developing uh, training packages. They already ha have uh, our, our central involvement in, uh, in training. And so they are developing, changing their, their training packages to take into account the kind of uh, findings that we're, that we're showing. So it will affect it in, in training in that way. I would also say though that uh, from the reaction, we, we, when these papers were published last year, um, it, it's, it's generated a lot of traffic among PWPs, among, among practitioners, and of course, management in, in NHS. And so they are beginning to see, as so often with, with our kind of work, their practice reflected in our findings. And they can begin, uh, you know, to to adjust, let's say, uh, of their own of their own accord. And I think that that is uh, that is certainly the reaction that we've had from from some PWPs, as indeed I got from work that I did for the police about twenty years ago. Exactly the same happened that the the, the police saw uh, what they do reflected in our, our findings and began to make adjustments. I mean, very significant adjustments. Paul. We're almost running out of time. There's just one great uh, question that's been posted, which we're going to have to answer um, um, from, from Oliver about job opportunities, but we'll answer that um, on the website. Sorry, Oliver. Um, I'm now going to ask all the team to switch their cameras on just for a minute, and I will just finish by um, thanking everybody for uh, the work that's gone into today. Um, we've seen those four case studies plus the roundup from Dan, and I would really encourage you, as Dan says, to look through the classroom materials because there's an absolute wealth of stuff there on the website. The recording and the slides are going to be on the website as soon as we can get them up there. Make use of the index and consider doing our MOOC. Um, and I will send you the inevitable post-workshop survey, which um, if you send us a great story, we'll send you a set of classroom posters. Um, which uh, you can see displayed before you. Um, but last but not least, a big thanks to everyone who's been involved, who's fed into today, um, behind the scenes or in front of the camera. And most of all, to all of you for um, tuning in today and those of you who will end up watching this later, a big thanks. And uh, we will look forward to seeing you next year in some shape or form. Thanks everybody. <laughs>